let's have a look uh, at the replay. We really don't want to harp too much more on this. It's a racing incident. They come out of the cutting. He was going down the inside of Bow. Whatever they just touched, he went out. Seaton went around. Bow connected with the wall. Well, if you look at that a few more times, if that chair yeah, Dick Johnson is, Dick Johnson was anything but uh, happy about that. One of the Cameron, he's pushed a cameraman over. Oh, Dick, I understand the frustration. Ain't going to win the race, though, mate. No, race, con race continues. Order. Seat. Gardner, second. Jones, third. And then another Jones runs in fourth. So the two PJ cars are first and fourth, and the two Coca-Cola cars are second and third. And behind them, then, it's Anders Olofsson in the Winfield Commodore. Sixth is Larry Perkins. Doesn't he need a yellow? Seventh is uh, Stephen Johnson and Charlie O'Brien in the 18 Shell FAI car. Next is Longhurst in the 25 car. In ninth spot, well done, Trevor Ashby and Steve Reed in the ICI Auto Color car. And Tony Scott and John Cleland run 10th. Yeah, what's gone is gone. We've got a whole new scenario to paint now here over the next uh, 64 laps because that's how far we've got to go in the yeah, 1000 for uh, 1995. And, a hard uh, 64 laps. A very hard 64 laps. But you've got to hand it to uh, uh, the Coke team. They've got uh, two cars in there running second and third positions at the present time. You've got to hand it to Larry Perkins, who got shuffled right back almost at the tail of the field after having to come in at the end of lap one to change a flat tyre. Could you calculate where he would be now? Well, wow. yes. Car number 25, the Longhurst Park car. It's been running reliably, but it's, uh, it's done a few pit stops in the last uh, half hour. It uh, is eighth on the racetrack, or was eighth on the racetrack, till it came into the pit, so they have a, a problem. We'll get a report from our pit guys down there. It uh, doesn't look too good at the moment. Don't like to see the bonnet up. They're uh, whipping off the valve cover, it looks like, so uh, could be the dreaded valve spring division. There's 16 of them in there is the most critical part in any engine. Now the folks came in. Let's go to Mark Osler. Mark, what's the uh, problem or the apparent problem? Uh, no problem. I think it's a scheduled stop. There is a bit of an oil stain at the back of the car. They may have a very slight differential leak in the coke car. It's been there for a number of laps, but none of the team look too concerned. Uh, Wynn Percy getting into the car. Bradley Jones out. Very quick stop. 21 seconds. Four, four tyres. Full load of fuel. Thanks very much, mate. As we continue with the uh, Tony uh, Longhurst car, it sits in pit lane. Uh, serious as, trouble here. Yes, the coke car heads out of uh, and up the mountain again. There comes the rocket cover off, just about ready to come off now. Now there's six boats. Some of them at the back are hard to get to. Be very, very hot there for the mechanic's hands. But uh, valve cover off means only one thing, Mike. And the valve springs uh, the toughest component to uh, live in any racing engine. One seconds over uh, Wayne Gardner and Neil Crompton. Now, what so this want? one's far from over. No, what he wants now is one of these perfect stops. Just a stop for 30 seconds, four tires. Let's go to Richard Hay. Thanks, Mike. Well, Glenn Seaton out of the car. David Parcel's getting in. Now this, I expect to be a brake pad change. Yes, Here we they're go. working on the front caliber. And you see how hot those brakes are. There's flame coming from the top of the disc at the moment. Amazing. The old pads have to get out, and I tell you, you wouldn't want to touch these without the uh, gloves on. Most of these discs made in England by Automotive Products, the same company that supplies all the Formula One lead teams. And here comes the second of the, uh, the number seven car is in there as well. So you have uh, Glenn Seaton and Gardner, the two cars, two drivers leading the race, and the other car is already back on the racetrack. Mark Oster's on the spot. Car 7, thank you, Wilco. The car in second position in the 95 Tui's 1000. A very slick stop. Gardner out, cropped it in. Fantastic. 21 seconds. Identical to the, the uh, number 4 car. Well, Alan Heapy has definitely got his boys uh, primed for action today. They've given them some beautiful pit stops today. But we're looking now at uh, David Parsons taking over from Glenn Seaton, who did a superb job to bring his car home. I would have thought that uh, would have probably moved uh, Alan Jones up into the lead in car number 35. Gardner has taken off like a scalded banshee, and then you've got uh, David Parsons in the 30 car, so it's going to be pretty tight at the front half of the field here for a spell. There's the uh, number three car. Lansvale Smash Repairs car, Steve Reed, Trevor Ashby, got some uh, new backing for their car for this uh, race too from Maguire's, uh, the car care products. 
This car always turned out in immaculate condition, and uh, these two guys, again, are a prime example of long-time campaigners who've got the plenty of experience and can stay out of trouble and out of harm's way. Larry Perkins in the pits. Yes, he's out. Back uh, goes uh, his co-driver, Russell Ingle, who's done a fabulous job here today. The Lansvale smash from his car goes back onto the race track. Looks like Steve Reed has climbed back into it as they head up to the, uh, the top of the mountain. It's going to be fairly tight. Number 35, the second of the PJ cars, has gone through to take the lead. It looks like the Longhurst car has taken off with Wayne Park at the wheel, I think. Or it might be the other way around, Longhurst. But 35 is your race leader. Wayne Gardner will be second. And... Uh... OK, let's go down. Uh, there's plenty of activity in the pits. Back to Mark Osler. Certainly is, Michael. That car, car seven, is second position. Alan Heafy two fantastic stops 21 seconds yeah great the, the guys have done a fantastic job with it they really have they've been getting their uh, driver changes uh, down pretty good they had a long practice last night and uh, the, the boys with the wheels are fantastic they can turn around four wheels in uh, 10 seconds flat now and uh, you know, the, the, the problem we've got is the fuel takes a bit longer and the drivers are a bit slower but otherwise we'd be doing it quicker yeah we're happy i know the critical thing with your car are these twin caliper front brakes that wally's been working on for the last two or three years it looks finally you're getting the advantage out of them no pad changes yeah well the race is not over yet you know we're uh, we're confident but not overconfident there's a long way to go um and uh, when we get to uh, lap 161 the jacket flag and if we're up there then i'll be a very happy man best of luck alan thanks mate thank you very much to mark osler there with uh, alan heafy it was Larry place. Perkins that had the quick uh, pit stop, not the Longhurst car. The 25 car has gone uh, back into the garage area. So they have some problems with it. Alan Jones, the, uh, the 35 car, leads this one. Wayne Gardner in second place in number four. And Glenn Seaton, David Parsons in third, sitting back behind him in car number 30. Then on the same lap as Anders Olofsson and uh, Stephen Richards. They are, those four cars are all on the same lap. Recapping them uh, for you, Seaton and Parsons has just altered uh, that a little bit because of the pit stops. It's actually Jones over Gardner, then Seaton. Then back to Olufsen and Richards. Next group behind them. Number 11, the Perkins and Ignall. Ingle, I should say. Then O'Brien and Johnson, Longhurst and uh, Park, Ashby, Reed and Scott and Cleland. Uh, still run inside the top ten. A great effort from them. We'll be back at Bathurst in just a few seconds. 35 to come in. Yeah, Alan Grice is getting ready to get into the okay. car. Okay, so it's time for the regular stops coming up again. That puts uh, that will put uh, Wayne Gardner, but Wayne Gardner is finding himself under increased pressure, as you can see here, as we take the Holden race cam, looking out from behind the seven car. And the man who's doing all the closing here is uh, David Parsons, who carries our McDonald's family restaurants race cam as they work uh, Mountain Straight yet again. This is a fascinating race, Alan. Yes, it certainly is, Mike. It's, it's what we said in the beginning. It's going to be a thousand kilometer sprint race. Uh, the best of the best have come and gone. Uh, we've had a uh, dramatic incident, mid-race incident between Glenn Seaton and John Bauer. And I don't think uh, there are going to be very many happy visits in, in either camp over that issue and uh, they'll be talking about that for a long time. Uh, a terrible race to get a, a biff and have a problem, but uh, it, 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 to me, it was a racing uh, incident that uh, only will be argued about in, uh, in uh, pubs around the country for some time. Oh, they really can. They can argue about it all day long. It's not going to change it, uh, and it is a pity. I mean, they race just so beautifully together for so many laps and one little touch, and it would have been anywhere else across the grass and rejoin the race. It wouldn't have been so bad, but they uh, have to hit the wall out of there. Here's the battle for second, and when the 35 Jones car goes to the pits, you'll have uh, Wayne Gardner in number seven, and uh, David Parsons in the 30 car vying for the lead here at Mount Panorama. Do you remember in too many of them uh, closer than this, Alan, no, over no, such a sustained period? Not at all. Not at all. It's uh, been uh, excruciating for, uh, for all the teams, and uh, hair-raising for the team managers. Alan Heafy will be really uh, sweating this one out tremendous compliment to him and his team to get two cars running so well as they're heading for a, a great result um, a winner be fabulous a second and a third would be <laughs> acceptable as well there's the give you an idea down into uh, caltex chase that slingshot at 280 clicks then down on the brakes into the left hander then the right hand of the exit as they come out of there they're still expecting the 35 car into the pits 
as uh, Neil Crompton. Wayne Gardner, the seven car, continue to lead David Parsons, who's doing all that searching. Here comes our race leader, Alan Jones, 35. He comes into the pits. And now it's uh, Wayne Gardner who takes over the lead, but he's under immediate pressure. Just the stop here. Not much happening there on the pit stop as they head up Mountain Straight. That's what they want to have, not much happening. Like you said, they want to get in there and out in less than 30 seconds. Snappy chains there on the right front, give the window a, a wipe while the car is still in the air. Nothing happens until they bounce down off the four red jacks, onboard jacks that whip these cars up on pogo sticks. No such thing as old fashioned jack handles under these cars anymore. The gardener has himself a, a great fight going here at Mount Panorama with uh, David Parsons. Well, Parsons will be uh, mentally very aware of the fact that he has a potential winning car that uh, his boss has brought in uh, after uh, an enormous duel with John Bow, and uh, he won't be taking any chances here. He may get up there and try and harass Wayne a little bit more, well, but uh, his job to bring this wheel. thing back. Neil at the wheel uh, in the seven car as they head across the top of the mountain, and. Uh, he, of course, uh, came up with a victory uh, for Mazda here in the 12-hour last year. And the final year it was held here at Mount Panorama. He's got a snip of the lead here. He's not going to throw, throw or give this one away without a, a, a fight. Well, it's been his ambition to uh, do well here in uh, Group A. Dedicated driver, fabulous commentator, but his desires were on the wheel. And uh, he certainly... Uh, gone through uh, the hardship of uh, some novice drives that, that didn't always work out the way he wanted but he's applied himself and with great vigor and energy to help uh, Wayne Gardner in all his pursuits a little nervous there uh, Neil take it easy he's, mate oh he's gone he's locked it up gone off on the grass under a bit of pressure there goes David Parsons and Crompton now comes back onto the track after leading it his world would have just disappeared down uh, in, in his stomach well, he he's going to pick it all up now, or is he headed for the pits? Now he's going to pick it up. No, he'll have to do another lap. I don't think he was uh, capable of getting into the pit lane. Well, he's very busy uh, chastising himself. He, he had to let it go. He did the right thing. Uh, yep. He'd locked it up. He didn't want to hold his foot on the brake. Would have absolutely ruined the tires. He let it go, and in the process, he had to go off course. Fortunately, no wall waiting for him. But in the process, uh, David Parsons didn't wait around to be asked uh, can he go through and uh, has left uh, quite a gap now on uh, Neil. So uh, Neil Crompton inside the number seven Coca-Cola race team car with Holden race cam. Uh, Neil, a little bit of a misadventure. There's cost you. That was a very stupid mistake, Gary. Uh, we've got a different front tire on the car and it's not stopping as well, but I'm the bloke in the pilot seat. And I just pushed a little hard. It's a badly flat spot. I'm going to have to come in and get another one. They weren't quite ready. Uh, front right's buggered. Well, I know you're pretty hard on yourself, but uh, still 57 laps to go in this race, and fortunately, just where it occurred, there was no real major damage. It could have been a lot worse. Yeah, I felt it go, but once you uh, once you try... Oh, hang on, I'm using the radio, I don't have to. Once you uh, try and um, un unlock a locked brake, you obviously add stopping distance, so I fired out into the paddock. Needless to say, I'm not a very happy camper. Uh, I can understand that, pal. All right, we'll let you get back to it, and let's hope that you can uh, recoup the position. Thanks, mate. Talk to you later on. Okay. okay. So Neil Crompton has got uh, head on back to the pits. He'll kick himself uh, over that one, but... Uh, this is a uh, tough business. Now. Yeah. These fellows are under enormous pressure. They work themselves up to get into the lead. They take the lead. They have someone on their back bumper bar, and the best of the best have been fold folding here like a uh, stale deck of cars. So Crompton heads on down. Let's check these out for you on our Shell race score. Our thanks to Shell for their support of the great race. It is David Parsons who continues to lead. Second place now because of the jumper will be uh, Jones and Percy, and third will be Olufsen and Richards. Behind them it is Jones and Grice. Then Perkins and Ingle in sixth spot. O'Brien and Johnson in seventh. Next is Ashby and Reed. What about that in the Lansdale car? Ninth, 21. Scott and Quellen in the Pinnacle car. And then Parsons and Crick round out the top ten in the great race for 1995. Back at Bathurst in just a moment.
once again, welcome back to Bathurst. What a dramatic fourth hour. Big changes have come over this race in the last 60 minutes. There have been problems left, right and centre. Paul Romano's had a lot of problems today with the, uh, the Commodore, the number 24. Tony Longhurst has, hasn't had a very good hour in his uh, Ford Castrol. This was OK. It was a flat tyre. They were able to get back, but since then they've had another one problems there for Olofsson and Richards Jr. But they're going pretty well at the moment. That was a Caltex chase. They were able to get back and they're currently in third place. No luck with the valve spring for Greg Crick and his uh, number 49 team, the Alcare Air Conditioning. But the big incident certainly occurred between Glenn Seaton and John Bow. They had been scrapping for about 20 laps. Been a tremendous duel between the two. Getting over the top. Seaton have been very fast across the top of the mountain. Bow seemed to have him covered along the straights. A little touch there. We've spoken to John Bow about it. We've spoken to Glenn Seaton about it. They both got their own points of view. He was able to get the car back, John Bow, into the pits. Dick Johnson was obviously very uh, disappointed. He was sitting there and waiting. They were leading. You can see the frustration from uh, Johnson's uh, point of view. Bow was able to get it back, but it looks like it's out of business for the rest of the day. And the product uh, cars also had lots of problems. The number 33 of Bob Pearson. A dramatic hour. Watch and win well. You'll be changing your tips left, right and centre. You haven't got much time now. This is the last hour up until 3 o'clock in this great uh, competition we're running with you. 0055 60677. Who will be 1, 2 and 3? Look at the prize at the end of it. The Commodore double S uh, V8 at uh, $42,300. So a reminder about that number. It's uh, up until 3 o'clock. 0055 60677. Mark Scaife was going great guns in a Commodore today. He joins us now. You've been sitting here for a little while. The action's been enthralling, hasn't it? It's been a fantastic race. Obviously, uh, you know, Glenn and John have been in close company in a little incident. But, uh, you know, all day there's been different leaders and it uh, looks fantastic so far. What about the second car from the Winfield Racing point of view? It's neatly placed in third. Fuel efficiency was great for your car earlier on. Could that play a part with maybe one less pit stop for Olufsen and Richards Jr.? Well, it may do, Bruce. One of those things that where you... Uh, you try, obviously, to drive the car as fast as you can, but the fuel economy is very important. And uh, it looks like we might be able to get through with only uh, two stops where the others would, we were going to make three. So uh, in that respect, yes, it does probably play a bigger picture in terms of their performance relative to the others to the end of the race. Alan Moffat and Mike Raymond made the point how graciously you accepted your position earlier today. How, how is it now, an hour and a half, two hours later? Because you really were racing away with this uh, two is 1,000. Well, obviously, you know, what do you do about it? The guys are probably more disappointed than what I am. You know, they've been working very hard. The car was, was fantastic. We haven't broken a tail shaft for years. And a, a stupid problem like that obviously happens in the biggest race of the year. So it's very disappointing. And Glenn Seat now, I know that a lot of people would have him as a sentimental favourite. Where do you think he's sitting right now? Well, I think really Glenn's probably in the box seat, to be honest. I think uh, the Bridgestone tyre at this time of the afternoon with the, with the track temperature and the, and the sunshine always works very well. And... Uh, David Parsons is going quite quick, so, you know, I think that he's probably the guy to beat. Mark, thanks for coming in and bad luck today. No problem, Bruce. Thank you. No, he's a great guy, uh, Mark Scope. Very gracious, as I said earlier. Had this one uh, shot to bits early in the, in the race. But uh, Dick Johnson, Sonny Liston from Brisbane, is just ready to come on out after they've uh, done the work on the 17 car. Positions unchanged. David Parsons at the uh, top of the crop in car number 30. Win Percy in the uh, four car runs in second. Then it's Anders Olofsson in the second of the Winfield cars, followed by Alan Grice, the second of the PJs. Neil Crompton in the seven. Then it's Russell Ingall in the Larry Perkins car in six. Charlie O'Brien is next, followed by Steve Reed. Then it's Scott and uh, Rodney Crick in the 25 car. Dick Johnson rejoins the race, car number 17. But some info here on. Uh, on Russell Ingle and uh, Larry Perkins. You'll recall after they had their problem this morning, they came out of the racetrack and they were 29. And uh, they were two minutes and 10 seconds behind the pack. Now, they're in sixth spot, one minute 29 behind the leaders and gaining. I mean, that is just the outstanding performance so far. And she's, I don't, I'd hate to see a yellow flag. I don't want to wish that on Glenn or anyone, but yellow flag could have Perkins back in this with Russell Ingle. I know it's all if and maybe, yeah. but if they hadn't had to come in to change that tyre at the end of lap one, where would they be running now? Uh, probably somewhere up around the front, I'd say. Well, Carl? Well, here we have Dick Johnson, and uh, I think he might be in just about the right frame of mind to put some fast laps down. Well, do you want to have a talk to him? Uh, I think we might just let him be for a bit, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, 
after Nick's cool down. Admiral, right. well, as he is yeah, in yeah. normal stance, uh, I think he's a little bit perturbed at the moment, and he's got reasons to be. He's lost his lead. Well, we couldn't have a chat anyway, because Dick has plugged the, the mic lead in anyway. So wise of him. <laughs> that might be a convenient uh, forget forgetfulness at the moment. But at least it goes to show the professionalism of the uh, Shell FAI team. They're back on track again after that bump with the wall, the exit to a BP cutting. And uh, the Queenslander is back on track, well down and uh, not with a winning chance or a top 10 chance, but he's out there to uh, give some service to his sponsors. And uh, Russell Engel in the meantime uh, in the Castrol Commodore carrying the Castrol Oils race camp. Has done a fabulous job to support Larry Perkins today. Well, Russell, we, Mike Raymond here, we were wondering what the uh, what could have presented if you hadn't had that tyre problem early in the race. Yeah, I can't quite hear you, Mike. Sorry, mate. Just hang on for a minute. I'll turn up the old button here. Is that better? Oh, that's worse. He's having a bit of difficulties there. He's a difficult part of the circuit as well. Maybe when he gets up on the top, he might be able to pick up our aerial a bit better. Well, there was a lot of discussion about uh, Russell Engel. He had some big shoes to fill in the late and great Greg Hansford's absence, but he has done an absolutely first-class job here. When he was out there running behind Scaife, desperately trying to hang on to him so he could try and unlap himself, and he did it lap after lap of great drive. Now well, Larry's very happy with his choice and uh, happy to uh, see him contributing to the team so efficiently. Some work going on here on the uh, price attack car. Kevin Heffernan and Stephen Voigt. And that's got to be the most striking paint job we've ever seen. It just looks fantastic, doesn't, doesn't it? Metres and metres of pinstriping all over the car. Price attack, a new sponsor. Australian Touring Car Racing, the cosmetics retailers. And they've been in behind Kevin Heffernan all year. And he really is one of the best turned out and presented privateers I've ever seen. Fabulous looking car. Okay, broken front uh, roll bar and straight bar and some people's uh, terminology. Just pulled out there, obviously either broken or they're adjusting it. And here we have number 11, but set such great pace on Friday. Larry, the fastest car on the track, didn't quite do justice to himself on to his top 10. He admitted that he was beaten on the day, but they started in third spot. I think we've stabilised the uh, the race cam. Russell, I think you might be able to hear us a little better now. Yeah, no problem. That's better. Mate, you're the fastest on the track and uh, still gaining on the leaders. I wonder what it would have been apart from that tyre problem in the opening lap. Oh, I tell you what, I can't believe it. I mean, the car's been running so strong. And Larry's been putting in some great times. And oh, I tell you, if we were out there, we'd be uh, rocking him. Are you enjoying this? Oh, yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> How could you not enjoy it? Well, well, the suggestion is after coming back from uh, uh, Formula Ford in the UK into one of these uh, taxi cabs, as they like to call them, with plenty of weight in them, they sure are still a buzz to drive. Oh, yeah, mate, I'll tell you what, well, as you can see, I'm fairly, fairly busy here, but, uh, oh, yeah, but it's good fun because it's, because I've been racing single-seaters all my life. It's, uh, it's good to get in something completely different and have to learn how to drive again, but, uh, uh, we're not out of the race yet, though, because, uh, I think once Larry jumps back in, he'll have his, uh, have his hair up and he'll be going for it, so uh, don't count us out yet. I won't. Russell, Russell uh, Gary Wilkerson, what chance we might see more of you uh, in touring cars in Australia the coming season? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Wilco. Uh, geez, I like to, mate. I really like to. Uh, I've had five years in England and I'd like to get back here. And this is what I want to drive, so uh, we'll see what we can do. Well, but, there you go. Thanks, Russell. Thank you. <laughs> a little bit there, but uh, that's a terrible. If you haven't done race cam, and that's Russell's first attempt at it, and he's, and he's the fastest car. He's got the fastest times out there on the racetrack. And I'll tell you, one yellow flag. Yep. It should be a helter skelter sprint with uh, the Perkins 11 car coming from the clouds. Well, these guys really have shown the spirit of this race, Alan. He's uh, 18 into the pits just as we speak. Yes, they've not had a happy day. They really, uh, you'd have to say, uh, as the ball bounces, the Shell team this year. Let's go to Richie Hay. Hasn't been Well, there. thanks, Mike. No prizes for guessing where the team uh, have come to look first. It's brakes once again for the 18 car. Charlie O'Brien at the wheel at the moment. But brake problems have beset this car since virtually the, the start of the race. An early pit stop because of them. And 
already working on, on bleeding the brakes once again. Now look underneath the bonnet as well, which is never the best of signs with any of these cars when the bonnet comes up. Charlie's still sitting in the car and still more work going on underneath the wheel arch on the brakes, mate. Yes, they've had an up and down day, haven't they? Uh, the the yes, Shell FAI team, particularly with the 18 car, qualified well by uh, Stephen Johnson sometimes. The works in your favour and sometimes you have days that you prefer to forget at Mount Panorama. There's a few would join the second category today. It's just catching a glimpse there of the carbon fibre air box that uh, is part of the air induction system on that engine. It's just murder, Alan, isn't it, in that situation, trying to bleed these brakes. They're operating at 800 degrees centigrade to try and get a plastic bleed hose onto the caliper and it just about melts on, melts the, on the surface. Melts in the fellows, if they wear gloves, they, uh, they have to and uh, they can't just get that finger feel for those uh, fine adjustments. It's a terrible job. Just the radiant heat coming off the discs is enough to give you a blister on your face. Back at the front, David Parsons in the number 30 Peter Jackson car leads the race. And uh, followed up by Jones and Percy. That's Brad Jones in car number four for team. Then Olofsson and Richards holding down third for Winfield. Then uh, Alan Jones and Gricey in car number 35 in fourth spot. Gardner Crompton after that little mishap for Crompton in fifth. Perkins Engel in sixth position. And Brian Johnson we just saw in the pits in seventh. Ashby and Reed. What a great job for the Lansdale Smash Repair boys in eighth. Scott and Cullen in ninth. And Parsons and Crick in tenth. 11th spot, 38, Poole and Ed Ordinsky. Now, that is a fabulous result so far. Waldock and McLaughlin and the Komatsu Falcon are in 12th. 13th is O'Brien and Callaghan in the Everlast Automotive Commodore. Well done, guys. Longhurst and Parker in 14th and 25. Then Scotty Taylor and Bell in the Xerox Shop Commodore are in 15th, 16th. 74, Heffernan and Voigt in the pits there with the price attack car. The Martin Golson and the AC Delco Commodore followed in 18th spot by Attard and Crick. They're on lap 94. Lap 94 also, 17, Johnson and Bauer. And out the first in number 20, Pearson and Stewart, who blow up the product Commodore. We'll be back at Mount Panorama Baptist in just a few seconds. 1,000 from Mount Panorama at Bathurst, 112 laps completed out of 161 race time. We've been running 4 hours, 24 minutes. The record for this race is 6 hours and 19 minutes, and I think we might be giving that a nudge here today. This is car 37, the uh, Xerox entry of Scotty Taylor and Stephen Bell, the car Commodore VP that we haven't had um, a lot of chances to have a look at today because the action for a fairly limited uh, field in terms of numbers 32 starters there are only 18 left the action has been thick and fast well, that's the determining factor isn't it well okay you can have a field of 55 cars but if they're all second rate preparation you're not going to have any left by the end of the day these are absolute top quality top of the range uh, racing cars that are anything equal anything in the world standard well as alan would know him on the track and me sitting up here in previous years we've had full grids of 55 and come uh, two o'clock in the afternoon we've had and struggle to find something to talk about. <laughs> Gary, you never struggle to have anything to talk about. <laughs> Xerox Commodore and the distinctive colours of Winfield Racing, of course, the X Winfield Racing Commodore VP. One of the very best ways to buy a race car, straight out of a professional team's hangar. Well, that is the beauty of this form, this five-litre domestic formula, Alan. It really is a kit car mentality. You can buy just about a four or five year old Holden chassis, updated to the new aero kit. You can put all sorts of three and four link rear ends, all sorts of engines in them, whatever whatever spare parts you can get your hands on. All you need is money. <laughs> That's right. But, uh, but it is wise to be able to buy a complete car from mm. a professional team like uh, Gibson Motorsport and just then go out and uh, drive it. We have eight cars on the lead lap in this race. Oh. And after 113 laps, we've got eight cars on the front running lap, led by David Parsons in car number 30 for Peter Jackson, uh, followed by Wynn Percy in car number four for Coca-Cola, then the surviving Winfield car, Anders Olofsson at the wheel in car number two, followed by car 35, the second of the Peter Jackson cars, that's Alan Grice driving for the moment, and Neil Crompton in car seven, the Coca-Cola team, is, uh, is next, and then Russell Ingle driving the uh, Castrol uh, Commodore for uh, Larry Perkins at the moment. All the drama after uh, looking so strong uh, for John Bauer and that little uh, coming together, well, uh, little nudge that he got from uh, Glenn Seaton. The damage to the car, it's been repaired. The car's back on the track. Dick Johnson is behind the wheel. We had a chance to uh, cool off a little, Dick. I will take uh, a fairly large bucket of water to cool me off. This is the most important race of the year and, you know, dumb things like that happen. 
I thought the guy was a bit smarter than that. So, uh, Dick Johnson, Mark Osler here. Are you uh, pretty sure it was an intentional uh, bump on Seaton's part then? You, you've only got to wait your time around here, Mark. And I'm sure you'll find uh, the 1,000 kilometres and we're only 500 k into it and then do things like that. I can appreciate how anxious the guy is because he's never won here before. And uh, for the debacle he's got going on and for Ford, I sincerely hope he wins in one sense, but uh, to be quite honest, I don't think I'll be having a beer with him tonight. Dick, can you understand that he sees the replay from a completely different angle to you? Oh, I'm sure he does. That's why there's always two sides to every story, Mark. Well, mate, try and uh, get on with your job. It's not over yet. It's a long way to go, and we saw how fast the lead cars dropped out earlier. Uh, just stay in there and uh, fight on like the champ you are. Oh, well, that's all we've got to do. You know, we're not going to gain much by keeping going now, but at least I might be able to take this opportunity to at least say uh, hi to all the guys uh, and girls that are in, in the fan club because they're the ones that uh, look after us. And I tell you, at the moment, I've just had a fud ruckus uh, Cajun chicken, mate, and I tell you what, I think I should have had a banana instead. You, but, wait, what? <laughs> you feel like flying at the moment, do you? Well, it's just one of those situations where uh, the old stomach's not doing what it should do. <laughs> but it'll go away. I've got plenty of water here. Nick, you just hang in there and do it for the fans and do it for Queensland, buddy. Yep. Not a problem. Okay, we'll leave you to it. Thanks, guys. Dick Johnson, whose uh, humour has uh, been restored somewhat, but as we said, uh, you can look at the replay and he and Glenn uh, Seaton could look at it standing side by side ten times over and they will never ever agree. And uh, it's always going to be uh, that way. It's an unfortunate incident and it has cost these guys a big chance at victory in this race. And here we go down into the end of Conrad, left-hander onto the straights. We're seeing Dick pulling 5.3, 6.1, 6.9, 7.3. Up to 166k already on pit straight. Ready for this left hander in the second gear. The red light shows. Accelerating now again up to roughly seven and a half. So seven two. Good changing. Seven two again. Very happy. Look at that speed go up, even uphill. And uh, here we have uh, dutifully bowing under the Holden Hill. 250k. Slamming it down into third gear for this fast right hander at Repco. Car has to slide over to the left, preferably off that curb. A new addition to the track over the last number of years. It wasn't there for many years. Drivers used to run right up to the wall, practically take their door handles off. Dick knows that corner well. It's where he had trouble in qualifying last year. And now a very difficult corner here where you go right and then you have to let the car slide over and uh, not hit that uh, bump on the left. Look at the speed. Would you like to be flying along here at 190? Well, the helicopter can't keep up with him. Across we go now into the dip. You'll hear him changing down into second. Must be second for this tight left hander into the dip. Accelerate like crazy. There he goes, right up to 7,000 RPM. Again, look at this in a short space of 150K. Hear the engine go off right down to under 100. And now watch this thing fly as he brings this Falcon up on the wing. Fourth gear, 209. Fifth gear, 225, 234. Sixth gear, we're going to go 250, 290. That'll be what he'll be looking for. 280, 88. And this oh, there it goes. 85. Down under brake. Sixth, fourth, third. Engine doesn't sound like working, but believe me, even at 4,000 RPM, a lot of work. That is a red hot lap of Mount Panorama in a fire breathing Falcon and Dick Johnson. What a ride. Oh, okay, let's uh, just take a squeeze back in the pack here. The uh, car 39 in the Everlast Automotive, and I tell you what, it has uh, this uh, sponsorship almost seems to have lasted forever. <laughs> for, for Bill O'Brien, he's been uh, punting around here at Mount Panorama for a long time. Brian Callahan in uh, tow with him on the, on this occasion, and uh, the car looking strong and surviving. Not uh, not in the top uh, in the top echelon at the moment, uh, running about 15th, I think, in the field. 
behind the land goal smash repairs Commodore. That's amazing. Look at the evolution of these Commodores over the years. That car just looks so unusual compared to the latest ones. Almost looks like a truck. <laughs> yeah. Developed by Tom Walkinshaw Racing right back in the late 80s for international Group A competition. The big wedge of a wing on the back. It's unbelievable. They used to call it the Batmobile at the time, I think, Wilco, because yeah. it was such an unbelievable number of ducks and wings and things all over it. The bee's knees at the time, but... Uh, Times change rapidly, don't they? So down Conrod Strait once again, and the last indeed, uh, an appropriate sponsor. These guys always turn out with a well-prepared car. Our aerial shot down Conrad shows them sprinting down toward Caltex Chase. This is a very hairy uh, spot, this. From 280 plus Ks, from sixth gear back to, what, uh, second when they hit uh, that? Third or second, depending yeah. on your ratio, uh, your dip ratio. Feel all our cars have the same gear box, Gary, but... Uh, feel uh, like your eyeballs are going to hit the inside of the windscreen. Probably. 15th start, 16th start indeed for Bill O'Brien. Bathurst regular. And uh, they're doing a great job out there. 14th and a long way to go yet. Well, we've had 116 laps completed. I think uh, we might check the full grid, 115 laps completed. Seaton and Parsons lead from Jones and Percy in second spot. Olofsson and Richardson, uh, Richards rather, for Winfield in third place. Jones and Grice the second. Peter Jackson car in fourth. Gardner and Compton holding down fifth for Coca-Cola. Sixth position, Perkins and Ingall. O'Brien and Johnson hanging on in seventh. Eighth is three. Ashby and Reed in the Lansdale Smash Repairs car. Ninth, 21. Johnny Clowens and Tony Scott still hanging in there. In position 10, 55. Parsons and Crick. In 11th spot, 38 is Poole and Ordinsky on lap 110. They're one ahead of Waldock and McLaughlin and the Komatsu Falcon. Same lap, Longhurst and Park and the Castrol Falcon. Then it's O'Brien and Callaghan in uh, car number 39. Position number 16, Johnson and Bauer back out there still fighting on. 17th, Heffernan and Voigt. 18th is Lamont and Gulson. 19th, Attard and Crick. And out of the race on lap 88, Pearson and Stewart. Position 21, Russell and Shaw. Romano and Dunstan out of 22. Scape and Richards in 23. And there, from there, Scape and Richards, you can see. These are the number of retirements out on 65. Finnegan and Gazard dropped out 54, 40. And here you can see the laps tumbling down. Very early retirements on the tail of the field. And the last two out, Lowndes and Murphy and McLeod and McLeod. That's the running order in the great race from Mount Panorama. Mount Panorama Bathurst as the Tui's 1000 continues. Lap 118 of 161, 4 hours 37, 30 into the great race. And we're on car number four. Driven by Wynn Percy, second on the road behind David Parsons. One spot ahead of uh, Alan Grice. Swinging down nicely on the inside of Wayne Russell here in the Road Chill Express car, 62 from Newcastle. Union Steel co-sponsors of that car. Wayne Russell is, I believe, uh, also going to involve himself in uh, some sprint car racing this year in a grizzly machine. Well, Wynn Percy and uh, Brad Jones are doing a great job here. Let's look at Wynn Percy, uh, English, of course, age 52. Age shall not weary the melon. Winner Thank of the Bathurst 1000 in 1992. Uh, here in 1991. Winner of the Spa 24 hour twice. Winner in fact 84 and 89. And winner of the British Touring Car Championship back in the early 80s three times. So a guy with a tremendous racing pedigree and every time he comes to Bathurst boy oh boy isn't he fast. He'll be very happy with himself out there at the moment. He knows he's working for a very good team and he'll want to acquit himself well and he'll be doing that as he is right now. Well, he, early in the week, he said he just couldn't get the setup. He and both Brad Jones just couldn't get the setup on the car exactly the way they liked it. But they'd adjusted their driving style and worked around the changes. And obviously, the car going very well. They really are maintaining the pressure here. It's just under 30 seconds. One more find the lead stop. car. These guys will need to get to the finish. And no pad change. That's the really important thing with these cars. We have uh, amazing how we haven't had uh, more than one pace car lap. 30, 30 seconds is just that is one stop and uh, that means the opposition have to have a perfect stop of course anything over 30 seconds in the pits and uh, who knows this race is far from over. Speaking of pad changes the number two uh, Winfield car and as uh, Olofsson has been into the pits they've had the uh, refuel pad change and a uh, driver change and Stephen Richards is now back on the track. They were in the uh, third spot when they went to the pit they rejoined in sixth place. So the order is still Parsons, Percy in second place, the Coke car, Alan Grice, the second of the PJ machines, runs in third, then Neil Crompton in the Coke number seven car is in fourth, then it's Russell Ingle and Larry Perkins, 11 Castrol Commodore, followed then by Stephen Richards in the two Winfield car, 
and Charlie O'Brien and Stephen Johnson in the 18 car. I'll tell you what, you've, uh, you've got to really give it to Brad Jones because uh, look at his record. Uh, third here in 1993 with Wayne Gardner, second here last year with Craig Lowndes. <laughs> He's, you can only go one better than that, Alan. He's looking in a very good position this year. Well, this is the Super League of uh, V8 cars. Let's go to the pits with Andy Raymond and a special guest. Yes, a Super League of our own down here, Mike. And uh, lurking behind the pit wall, I've spotted Rugby League International Bradley Clyde up here with your lovely fiancé, Tony. Enjoying your day? Yeah, certainly. Put on a beautiful day here, Brad. Who's the tip? Well, um, at the moment, I'm not quite sure... Uh, uh, we were going for Longhurst because we've got a relative in the pit, so um, um, uh, uh, he's about 14th at the moment, so hopefully he can drag him back. Bradley, obviously you'd like to be over in England. Is Mount Panorama the second best place to be at the moment? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Well, just having a few quiet beers in the Tui's tent and um, making a day of it. I'll give you a quick tip. Don't go up on the mountain. You'll never survive. <laughs> no, I haven't got the tough stickers, the, the, the tattoos and the goatee and that. I, I'm afraid to go up there. You need more than the Canberra Ford pack to get out alive. Bradley Clyde, enjoy your day. Thank you. <laughs> they go to the top of Mount Panorama again. Just the safe side of the top. That's the racetrack. You went up for the first time yesterday. You told me you'd, you'd, when you did that report earlier this morning that uh, you'd never been to the top there amongst the... Uh... 25 years, I yeah. never went up. Well, fairly busy down the pit lane. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it is another world. The, the aficionados and the fans that love to uh, get there early and grab their little spot. Yes. Squatters' rights uh, prevail. And heaven help anybody that gets uh, in the wrong spot. Okay, Don't Commodore. Okay, Commodore still circulating very quickly. 217-1 there for Percy Parsons, just fired off at 217-2. He's matching him, lap for lap. Getting some tremendous speed out of the co Commodore. Bradley Jones and Wynn Percy, great driving combination. Both former drivers for the Holden Racing Team. And uh, I bet today, more than any day, they'd be glad they weren't with the factory in 1995. Yes, this is a good day to be uh, with somebody else. Been out first all fine batters for a few years too. It really is, yeah, that stint down in the pits. It's very, very hot down there. Track temperatures currently in excess of 35, 40 degrees centigrade. So, boy, it's giving these tyres and the whole car, the driver, the whole package a real workout today. You've got to do a double take, haven't you, with David Parsons? The first look, you think it's seat. They're just so much alike. This guy, he just amazes me. He's the classic once-a-year racer. He works down on that, works like a dog down on that uh, dairy farm in Tasmania. He runs a fleet of uh, earth-moving equipment, bulldozers and tip trucks. He's a very busy man down there, businessman indeed. But every year they call on him to do a job, and boy, doesn't he get on with it. It's quite an art to be able to do it once a year. He, when this guy came onto the scene in the early 80s, I think his first appearance at Bathurst was with Peter Jansen way back in 1982, and he really was a sensation. Won the Rookie of the Year award, came back, qualified very strongly in 1983, and of course uh, ended his Group C career with Peter Brock, finishing second in 1984. But ever since then, really, has not been able to snare himself a regular touring car drive, which is quite amazing when you look at the guy's raw talent. Just updating our calculation on the current times that they're putting in here, I'd say we're looking at a race finish somewhere between about 4.14, 4.16, which would still be a, a new uh, a race record time. Indeed. Well, it's a long hour for these fellows now, Gary. They start hearing all sorts of things, and uh, really, as far as the equipment is concerned, it's getting towards it's used by date and uh, every minute counts now every lap that is under their belt they'll be happy with one down one away 28.99 the split between david parsons and win percy that's been fairly constant well it is last, just last time across the strike 2782 to parsons 2784 to percy this is a fabulous battle and all it's going to take is a pace car lap and that code commodore will be hanging right off the rear wing of this thing three quarters of race distance gone Let's go down to the pits. Thanks, Mike. Well, you talk about a pace car lap uh, making the difference. Alan Jones running in third place at the moment, and uh, things have gone fairly well for you so far. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, radio's not working, but that's the only problem. So if that's all we have all day, I'll be very happy. I spotted them hanging the sign out earlier on to, uh, to let you know when to come in. Yeah, well, we've got a little thing up on the windscreen telling us if all else fails, read the instructions. And uh, one of them was to put the headlights on up the pit straight if I couldn't hear them. And then the indicator and hazard lights for various other things. So we've got it fairly well worked out. Just going back to the start of the race, you got it blinded, didn't you? Yeah, it was. It was a good start, and uh, you know, which is all important here to get out of the melee. 
and uh, yeah, it was good. But how much longer before you jump back in the car? I think about another 12 laps. All right, well, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard, and to Alan Jones. Just back to uh, fifth, Russell Ingall. You'll recall earlier we told you he was the fastest man on the racetrack, still is. He's picking up the leaders at two seconds a lap. That's after losing 10 seconds in the lap that he spoke to us. So uh, that race camp can, uh, can affect you, but uh, he's back and going after the leaders. Seekman Parsons continue to lead on lap 121, 28.99 in arrears. It's Wynn Percy in the Coke Commodore. Then it's Jones, Alan Jones and Alan Grice from the Peter Jackson Falcon, followed then by Wayne Gardner and Neil Crompton in the Coke Machine, Perkins and Ingle in the Castrol Commodore. Sixth place, Olofsson and Stephen Richards. Then it's O'Brien and Johnson in the Shell FAI Falcon, followed by Ashby and Reed in the Lansdale Smash Repairs car. Scott and Johnny Cleveland in the Pinnacle Motorsports Nokia car. Parsons and Crick round out the top ten. But there's more action to come from Mount Panorama Bathurst when we return after the break. Bathurst, the great race continues. Lap 123 of 161, 448, 44 into the race. And the eighth place car on the racetrack this beautifully turned out. Maguire's ICI Auto Color, car of uh, Steve Reed, heads along uh, pit straight. Gone for, a new, yep. gone for a new color scheme this year, very distinctive. This car always uh, one of the most eye catching designs you'll see on a racetrack. And with those sponsors on the car, if it doesn't look good, then they ought to explain something. Trevor Ashby and Steve Reed sharing this car, they're having a great run. Don't forget, we've only got about 15, or you have 15 minutes to go for our watch and win. Don't forget that, that number again, 0055 60677. And all you have to do is dial in the numbers of the cars that you believe will finish first, second and third. Then dial in your own phone number, and then the computer will pick at random a winner after the race con is concluded. And we'll be able to give you the winner's name before we go off here at 6 o'clock Eastern time here in Australia. New Zealand... Uh, viewers don't apply for this competition it is going to be close though at the moment it is car number 30 that leads the four car the 35 the 7 and the 11. you take your pick and you can win that new holden ss commodore v8 valued at forty-two thousand dollars a magnificent machine yeah full credit to uh lansvale smash repairs this team their 15th start at bathurst and they, they don't go the usual way of privateers and buy an ex-factory race car these things are prepared built themselves in-house by ronnie gillard Engines by Wayne Smith, and they were always put together a very strong package at Bathurst. And um, don't they uh, don't they enjoy their racing? Yes, uh, affectionately known as the Lansdale Boys, and Trevor and Steve. They've uh, made a significant contribution to the support of the Shell Championship all year. These guys, yeah, all well, these guys, Car 21, these guys are battling with the Car 3 for the uh, title of top privateer here today, John. Cleland and Tony Scott in Tony the Scott. Pinnacle Motorsport car. Tony Scott behind the wheel at the moment. There's the gap, 12 seconds, and he's closing on the Ashby Reed car at two seconds a lap. In fact, uh, John Cleland had a scary moment with the uh, propeller shaft on this car after that horrible moment with Brock's car when it actually exploded and punctured through the floor a couple of years ago. He felt that there was something going wrong with the tail shaft. He brought it in and they traced it to a couple of loose bolts. So, Alan Moffat, that's a great feel for a car, isn't it? Well, he didn't win the British Touring Car Championship without having a, a feel for uh, and a finesse factor. And that's uh, a real good driver and a driver contributing to the success of the team. Well, that two and a half minute stop to replace those uh, two bolts, in fact, dropped these guys behind Reed and Ashby. This is the battle. Ashby and Reed in eight. Here's the pinnacle car at ninth, as we said, closing on uh, the guys in front of them at a rapid rate. Tony Scott's been working hard for quite a number of years to get uh, something together in the touring car category, and when uh, the pinnacle sponsorship came along, it gave him the opportunity to do so. He was teamed first with uh, Alan Grice, but now with John Cleland uh, for this big race, and they're doing very well. 17 is in the pits. Johnson Bow, what a sad tale for them after the uh, earlier mishap with John Bow leading the race and a small touch from Ben Seaton put him into the wall and uh, it took them several laps to get the car repaired. It's out and circulating. Dick Johnson now a little more philosophical at the wheel but obviously continuing problems with the car and they're out there to show the flag uh, but that's uh, that's about it I think for the rest of the day. Problems underneath? Yeah there's no urgency in their uh, pit stop and uh, so obviously they have a problem we'll have a report on that for you in a matter of moments they'll change the tires and uh, go out and try and get a, uh, a reading on uh, 
What are they doing? The, the, the verdict here in a minute doesn't look like there's much activity no. going around. Tyres, in fact, staying on the car. Is Dick going to get out? Bit of a discussion between Johnson and his team technicians. Oh, that's it. Yeah, looks like that's it. They've, they've had it. We'll have a report from down there in just a second. Well, isn't it amazing? There's a lot of money riding on this team normally. Not a problem with Bathurst, a fantastic finishing record. And today has just turned really bad. You can see Dick's di bitterly disappointed, but at the same time, I mean, uh, the accident earlier today put the, uh, put the issue beyond doubt. They weren't going to win this year, and it's only been a matter of uh, circulating out there. Well, if it was easy, Mike, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. Car 55, David Parsons. Now, it's easy to get confused. If you're listening to this show, sometimes people think David Parsons is a different David Parsons. Both Tasmanians, of course. But David, uh, trucking operator from our southern state and uh, moving into Group A competition this year. Also, races, trucks. That's Rodney uh, Crick, um, co-driver, and uh, with a very good reputation. Not hard between the Parsons and the Cricks here today to get mixed up between them as... Uh, the Longhurst uh, Castrol Falcon goes by. They've been reporting a, a vibration in the car, the 55 car, for a number of laps, but they're soldiering on. Yeah, currently running a little bit, with a little way down the order, but uh, still powering along. And the Larry Perkins, another one of the Larry Perkins customer cars on the track in 1995. 35 laps remaining. 35 remaining. Let's go down and have a word with Dick Johnson. Thank you, Mike. Dick, bitterly disappointing for you. Yeah, it is a bit disappointing, but, uh, you know, it's all come stem from the one thing, which is uh, the car stopping in the hall like that, you know? What is the problem with the car now? Well, when you get a sudden stop like that, and it's, jer it's jerked all the tail shaft and everything, and it, uh, it's got to the point where the, the rear flange on the gearbox is coming loose. It's been something like 14 months, I think, that the team's gone almost unbeaten. Yeah, probably would have done the same today. Bad luck. Thanks, Richard. There's Dick trying to smile, but uh, he, he's really, uh, he's cut up about this incident. Just shows how cruel this place can be, Alan, and you'd be more experienced than most in how cruel this race can be to you. Uh, you can swallow the mechanical failures, but uh, you do feel bitterly uh, upset when you feel that uh, you've been knifed by a competitor. And uh, I'll stand by my original uh, comments. Um, it's uh, a racing incident, and uh, this is one time when uh, the Shell team haven't come up on top. Yeah. Neil Crompton, meanwhile, hard at work in car seven. The Coke Commodore is currently running in fourth position. And um, his team driver and team owner, Wayne Gardner, is in the pits with AJ. Thanks very much, and usually you're pretty cool, calm and collected, Wayne Gardner. You're a little bit fidgety, my friend. Um, yeah, just a little at the moment. It, uh and Neil uh, locked a wheel up and speared off and we had to come in and put another tyre on a set of tyres. So it's obviously put us a couple of minutes behind now the leader, so yeah, it was a bit of a disappointment. Yeah. But um, still, you know, another hour or so to go and uh, we'll just keep pushing on and see what happens. You're jumping back into the uh, into the car on the next stop, uh, a regulation stop? Yeah, yeah, I'm finishing um, the race off, so uh, yeah, Crombie's doing a good, great job out there, but uh, it's just disappointing what happened there earlier. You've got a heart the size of Queensland, how hard are you going to go? Well, I'll go as hard as I can, um, but obviously I want to make the car finish as well. I'll just drive my heart out. I've drove my heart out at the beginning of the race, and um, in fact, even the second stint, so I'll just try and do the same again for the third, and you know, where, we end up, where we end up will be it. You've done everyone proud, especially your sponsors. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Wayne Gardner is only confident there, but meanwhile, this team car, car four, is rapidly closing the gap to the leader. It was originally 28 seconds. Now it's down to 16.3 and closing. When Percy just brought it down another two seconds that lap, could the lead car be in trouble? Well, we'll soon know. Well, when Percy's had enough laps around here to be able to smell a uh, victory. There's the order, Seaton and Parsons. David Parsons behind the wheel. Lap 127, a 16 uh, second buffer over Win Percy. Then it's uh, Alan Jones, Alan Grice, then uh, the uh, Neil Crop and Wayne Gardner car, Perkins and Ingall still ran out the five. They're all on the same lap. Sixth spot is the Olufsen, Stephen Richards, Winfield Commodore, O'Brien and Johnson, 
in the 18 car are in seventh spot. Ashby Reid climbing up through the field in eighth. Next is Scott and Cleland in the Pinnacle Motorsport car in 55, Parsons and Crick. That's your top ten at Bathurst, but it's getting a little tight at the front of the field. The Jackson car of race leader David Parsons. We mentioned before that he was losing ground. It dropped about 12 or 13 seconds. The reason for that, we understand, is he has dehydrated. And uh, Glenn Seaton has decided to bring him in a couple of laps early. He's already unbuckling, uh, trying to get himself prepared to pole out of the car. And Richard Hay will be there for the uh, cross. Only 14 seconds between first and second. Well, thanks, guys. And you're absolutely right. Apparently, David Parsons is dehydrated. It, the temperature down here, honestly, is, is higher than I'm used to. And inside of one of these race cars, it's that much higher still. This is a, a pretty standard fuel stop. They did the pads, remember, last time, Rand. So no pads to be done, just fuel and tyres. Glenn being strapped into the car. Windscreen clean. <laughs> straight back into the race i tell you stops don't come much quicker than that no that was a beauty wasn't it there's our leader win percy number four heads up to the right hander at repco bend the break is not an enormous one car 30 was first when it came in it's now back to four that's how close it is at the front of the field well this is the voodoo hour the last one and uh you saw it uh, fatigue and dehydration Yes, all happening, as um, Alan said a moment ago, the voodoo hour. Uh, lots happening in the fifth hour. We've got uh, about an hour and a quarter to go, maybe. Alan Grice and Alan Jones have been going pretty well. They're currently in about third position, so they're still in with some sort of a chance. We saw Alan Jones a moment ago. Uh, this was Crofton's incident. They were in front of the time, being chased by Parsons, just locked up a break then had to come in and change the tyre and it did cost them a position they're back to fourth place we spoke to wayne gardner a moment ago seen david parsons come in dehydrated i spoke to somebody from the institute of sport a physiologist earlier who was telling me that the drivers are losing up to three kilograms when they're out there for an hour and a half so it is a bit of a problem dick johnson went back out after the incidents concerning glenn seaton and john bauer they went back in 19th place and gave it a go and did a couple of very, very fast laps. The other Shell FAI cars really struggling at the moment with the brake pads, etc. Steve Johnson and Charlie O'Brien, they were recently in seventh position, but uh, they've been into the pits quite frequently, particularly in the last hour or so. And Dick Johnson had to give it away after going back in 19th place. It's been a fairly wretched day for the Shell FAI team. So two of the biggest names, Brock and Johnson, not really having a very splendid Sunday afternoon here at Bathurst. So the great race continues and the gap at the top is closing. It has been a fascinating day. There's our race leader in car number four, Wynn Percy, the Coca-Cola Commodore, in second place, or was uh, Alan Grice and uh, Alan Jones, but I have a feeling they came into pit which would move uh, David Parsons and Glenn Seaton up one spot. That'll sort itself out within the next half lap. This is definitely our race leader. Oh. Hang on, he's slowing down. Yeah. Oh, hang on, no, he's picked it up again. Did he miss a gear there? It might have. It's had an ominous uh, pail of smoke coming out the back. It looks uh, a little bit like a diff problem. Well, Coke team set up for a pit stop here. That was uh, quite frightening. Would have lost a heartbeat or two in the Coke team there. Momentary pause as he came through the corner. The corner, I believe there's going to be a driver change. Brad Jones getting in for the final stint. No, he's back up to racing speed. He could, could well have missed it. Just, a, just might, missed a gear there. Might have just been a little hiccup in the fuel system. Uh, some, they're, they're not always perfect. And uh, if he is down to the last splash, uh, the uh, well, I believe the Coke, Coke team works on a uh, as Bradley Jones boy. He's got to have the drive of his life. Last time he was sitting in the garage watching Craig Lowndes go to the end. Now he's going to do it prove his metal at the wheel of the Coke Commodore. But I was saying before, I think the Coke team works on a two-lap reserve strategy. They get a cough, they can run one lap. If they really have to stretch it, they can do two, but that's it. That so might have been the cough. Yeah, Percy could well be right on his last drops of fuel. Well, he is one lap over, apparently, on the scheduled stop, so yes. That would make sense. Yeah, he's right on the reserve now, just stretching the fuel economy out as far as they possibly can. Rob Benson, the former Holden Racing Team engineer, working feverishly over the... Uh, gap between Sandown and Bathurst to make sure the fuel economy in these cars was the best he could get it. Now 
been a competitive showing at the moment. Leading the race, but a pit stop to come very soon. Track surface temperature for uh, tyre wear and driver comfort is coming down after being up to 34 degrees, now 30 degrees and dropping off as the afternoon uh, extends. Here he comes. Win Percy buckles off through the locks of brake. He's in a big hurry coming for the pit entry. He doesn't care about those tyres. Andrew Raymond, take it away. Thank you, Marcos. We'll keep the timer on this. A very, very important pit stop. The number 35 car is just going into the first corner on the track. Now Bradley Jones into the car again. A routine stop. They're going to fill it up with petrol. They're putting brand new Dunlops on the car. And they are working feverishly. Actually, the team just got a talk by Wally Story and team boss Alan Heafy. Let's make it smooth and quick. Quick and smooth it is as Bradley Jones heads out of pit lane. 25 seconds. <sighs> Did they be taking some good stops, haven't they, Alan? All that's, day, that's they really fantastic. haven't made the slightest mistake. You might fluke one occasionally, but you don't fluke five of them. Car four was in first position, of course, before it came into their stop. Rejoins in fourth position on the lead lap, of course, so plenty more to come. Russell Engel brings the Castrol Commodore in. So Larry out to give it the last shot to the flag. He'll be primed and ready. What a disappointment for him today. He's done so well. He just can't fight any kind of a handicap here. And to get it on the opening lap and have to fight that through all day long mentally, I think he's done a superb job. It's been almost and like the 1,000-kilometer contests of old, Alan, when we didn't have pace cars at all. These guys have been running absolutely flat out, except for that one little pace car. Well, remember the... <laughs> yeah, I'll close the door later, yeah. thanks. Don't worry about that. Larry Perkins tightens up the belts. That's very important. This is time to absolutely go for break. You see, uh, Perkins lost his drink straw there. It's fallen down beside him. I hope he can retrace that because it's going to be hot, hard work for the final stint in this race. He'll fiddle around and try to get that back up again. But just at the moment, he wants to settle down. Another little tug on the belts. Very important in the event of an accident that he doesn't go forward. Yeah, and with regard to the drink straw, well, David Parsons knows that because he dehydrated badly and Glenn Seaton's back now in the number uh, 30 car. David Parsons is uh, down with Richard Hay in the pit area. Well, thanks, Wilco. David, yeah, they tell me you were dehydrating out there and that was why the Coke Commodore was closing on. Is that right? Yeah, very, very hot. And uh, there's, there's no one known can you duplicate those sort of temperatures out there. That's the biggest problem. But uh, so I just backed off that little bit, just rode out back and I had plenty of lead, so... I wasn't frustrated. No way known was I going to try and keep the pace up and end up crashing because that gets absolutely nowhere. The car is absolutely in fantastic shape for Glenn to get into it if he's got to race anybody, so I've done my job. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Done it well, too, mate. He is, he is one smooth operator. Just plug him into the car, he does the times, he goes home again to Tasmania for 12 months. Milks the cows. What, what an ideal employee, Wilco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Glenn Seaton back in the car. For the run of the flag 132 laps down that time around but here's his teammate alan jones and alan grice the second of the peter jackson fords really, they've got a hand it to glenn he has had reliability problems here over the years but these two cars are just running so strongly this year to keep two of them going mark it's a tremendous effort it's an unbelievable effort and uh, just to say that i believe the sonovas falcon is back into the race again well they obviously found the wire that was loose. Well, just talking about Wynn Percy, a fabulous drive to uh, really put the squeeze on David Parsons. He's down to the pits right now. Thanks very much, Mark, and a man they could do call, and for good reason, the consummate professional win, an outstanding drive. Thank you. My God, it's hot out there. <laughs> I think it must be the hottest bathurst in 10 years. David Parsons complained of that. He said not only is it hot in pit lane, but once you get in moving, and especially up around the S's on the mountain, you really start the pace is up anyway it's more like a sprint race than an endurance race um, it's very very hot my car is good what what a team it's it's uh, consistency as far as coca-cola team this year is outstanding well while well, i haven't been part of it this year obviously i've been back in uh, in europe um it's a pleasure to be back with the team they deserve better they've had a bad run of luck and uh, hopefully today's their turn richard spoke to you earlier and said you hadn't in fact been doing a hell of a lot of driving <laughs> When it comes to stuff like this, you really do need it, don't you? Well, I did Le Mans with Jagger, and I've been yeah. racing a horror sports car in Europe anyway, so I certainly haven't been sitting around. Wynn will let you go enjoy the rest of the race. Thank you. Yeah, charming man, Wynn Percy, 52 years of age, former team manager indeed of the uh, Holden Racing Team. Here comes car 35 in for its final stop for the day. Just take them out of the lead now. Alan Jones. 
brings it in. Hand over to Alan Grice. Brings it into the pit lane. And Peter Jackson team ready and waiting. So Alan Jones getting in. Grice out. Alan Jones out, I should say. Grice getting in quickly. Tires on, four tires, fuel, clean the screen. Looks like a regulation stop at this stage. And the Coke team car, up. number seven, has gone through as we speak to assume command in the race. The 30 car has gone through for Peter Jackson to take second spot. Looks like he might rejoin in the third. No, when uh, Brad Jones, in fact, in the number four Coke car is coming around. So it'll be a dice here between these two. <laughs> here we go. So Jones in the lead. And Jones... Back to fourth. Back to fourth. So here's our race leader, Brad Jones, still in control. As they head up the mountain once again. As you've mentioned before, uh, the pride's made uh, a couple of times and uh, been with a lot of great teams here, but this is uh, one time where Brad Jones would like to uh, just keep things the way they are for the next 20 laps. Like I said, he's on the staircase to success. Well, the man who's just jumped out of the 35 Falcon, no doubt hot and sweaty, Alan Grice with him is AJ. Alan Grice, hot and sweaty, exactly the word, Mark Osler. How are you feeling? I'm oh, fine. Um, I only had to do, do a single stint that time, so it was a lot easier. The other one was a double stint. But, um, gee, so far so good. The really car's fine. We've got a little bit of a gearbox uh, temperature problem, but uh, we're just going to soldier on with that, and uh, it'll do as, with itself as it may. Alan Moffat was saying earlier... Um, he's been here for a few years now and it's virtually back to the old the older days where there's been no pace car intervention it's a thousand kilometer sprint yeah there was a pace car that did affect us because it was a very poor restart i'd like to see it on uh, later tonight perhaps but i just didn't i was on the back of the queue i'd come in for fuel and i just didn't have any message i just didn't know that this race had started and i lost a really did lose a lot of time but I don't know if they made a bit of a slip up or maybe I wasn't told by the crew. Alan will let you go and uh, enjoy a nice cold one. I'm sure Gricey will too. Thanks, Andy. And it won't be a Coke, I don't think. <laughs> so we've just saw that shot before. David Parsons put it into the wall on the uh, uphill sweep to Repco Corner. I wonder if that's going to require a pace car. Well, it is in the precarious position. We've seen a few of these cars coming off today. They haven't put, called out the pace car, but uh, that could well be one. He's sitting right on the edge of the racing line. Now it takes him a while to get the message down to control and make the decision, so let's give him another half a lap. So Neil Crompton. Still in the uh, Coca-Cola Commodore as we take hold of the race cam aboard, car seven. And he's coming up to this stricken car right now. Just see it parked off to the side of the track there. Could well be off the racing line, we shall see. I bet he's breathing a sigh of relief for Mike after that little off earlier that cost him the lead to be now back in front. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet uh, Neil's feeling on top of the world. Certainly a lot better than he felt a little earlier today. Sometimes, you know, you have an hour that you're on an upper and an hour you're on a downer. How's it feel at the moment, mate? Um, each way bet, I'd say, Mike. I can't, uh, I can't really get a good idea of the picture of the race at the moment, so all I'm doing is drive my backside off and... Uh, Hopefully I'll make up for that pathetic mistake I made. Well, don't be too hard on yourself. You're not the only driver that's done that. You're about six seconds as we read it in front. And it looks like uh, with the push you had in the car before, you might have to carry this home. It's actually evened out quite well, Mike. Um, early on with a full load of gas, uh, she pushes straight ahead. As the load comes off, the balance is actually quite good. And the speed at the moment seems to be quite reasonable and on a par with most of the guys that have been circulating at the front all day. Well, it's, as I said, it's been up and down, but you're back up there in front. That car of Parsons, I've got yeah. a feeling, I've just seen the pace car come along uh, pit lane. Jeez. Do you want a pace car or would you rather continue? I don't know, to be honest, Mike. Okay. It's so hard to work out from here. All I do is drive hard and let the other guys do the stats. All right, son. You've done a well... You've done a terrific job for Coke today. The team has been absolutely 100%. They ought to sack me for what I did, though. Oh, they probably will, but don't worry. That's another story. See ya. See ya. <laughs> that's the, uh, the other David Parsons car, and this is what happened. Well, he's, wow. in, uh, he's got out in the grass there. He had a little agricultural approach here to Repco. He has had a huge accident there. 
And uh, the Attard car has come up on the inside. He's sort of tracking across to the Make, right. Making sure he gets out of the way. See, I wonder what happened there. Must have been, a you would imagine, a mechanical failure. And then all of a sudden, you know what's going to happen Correct. here, don't you? Right. Wang oh, another concrete wall. Well, just where that lump of concrete is there, a couple of years ago, we had uh, one of the two leader cars go straight in the gap. That used to be a Marshall's area there. Is Wayne Gardner getting ready for his the final pit stop here? Well, now's the time if he uh, takes a pit stop under the yellow, as we say, under the pace car, safety well, I, car. I'll tell you what, you can use all, <laughs> all the chances you like. Alan Horsley, who's masterminded four wins in the 12-hour for Mazda, unbelievable record, always comes along and helps us with our broadcast. And about 20 minutes ago, he slipped me a piece of paper that said, if there is a pace car, Put your money on Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got your pace car, Al. Perkins is absolutely Perkins and Russell Ingle, I should say. Yeah. Both well, been flying all day. 20 minutes away. The bet's closed at 3 o'clock, on, so you can't get that one down, I'm afraid. No, the 0055, that's closed, so don't bother start ringing it now because it closes an hour out from the, uh, the estimated finish time of the event. When you think about it, this Seaton, uh, Brad Jones, and Alan Jones, they've all been in for their final stop. The Coke Commodore in the lead at the moment under the yellow, but he has to still make his final stop. So when we go back to uh, green, we're going to have a battle between the three of them. Let's have a look at this. Top ten. Neils on wheels. And the Coca-Cola Commodore leads from uh, Seaton and Parsons. Jones and Percy run third. Jones and Grice run fourth. Persons, Pars uh, Perkins, I've said it all day, and Ingle in fifth spot. Olufsen and Richards run in sixth. O'Brien and Johnson in seventh. Scott and Clellan in eighth. Ashby and Reed have made nine out of the top ten. And Mark Poole and Ed Ordinsky. Well done, guys. You're in the top ten. Back for the restart in a moment. The pits. We are under a yellow flag. David Parsons takes up the lead. Brad Jones runs in second at this moment. Alan Jones. Alan Grice. Yes, Alan Jones in third. The Johnson car and Perkins is in there as well Tony. as Wayne Gardner jumps back into the number seven co Commodore. Tony Longhurst in as well. Now to you, Richard. Thanks, mate. Well, the race particularly for Wayne Gardner and Neil Crompton is to get out of the pit lane before it closes. Well, there's a fascinating scrap coming up here. Crompton will go to the back of the queue, but there are now five cars. Seaton, Brad he's Jones. Out. He's out, so he's lucky. Seaton, Brad Jones, Alan Jones, Stephen Richards and Larry Perkins, they're all on the lead lap. And all bumper to bumper. All bumper to bumper. So we've got like, what, a 25 lap sprint to the flag. Boys, this is going to be exciting. Who do you think's mentally primed for this? Well, we're going to find out, hopefully, if I can get across uh, going here with uh, the Larrikin. Okay, they're in behind the Jackaroo. You got your instructions? Okay, I'll just wait until he finishes with his pit crew. If you've ever seen a fight back like this, Michael, more than a lap down earlier on in the day, he's now in contention for the lead. He's hung in there, bulletproof engineering, Larry Perkins, fantastic co-drive by Russell Engel. Well, you're a lap down at one stage, you're a street fighter, and if you are, you've got time to do some spot -o. Yeah, I, I had a bad draw with the old uh, pace car early on, but it's worked in our favour right now, and uh, it's uh, unbelievable. We've all done our stops, and it's a race to the finish. Well, mate, you can run for the Liberal Party now with a fight back like that. We wish you luck to the flag. Thanks, Ryan. All right, so I guess the plan is you've got to try and go from where you are to up alongside uh, Glenn Seaton as quickly as you can. Yeah, not wrong about that. Well, Larry, you've put in some amazing performances at Mount Panorama. If you pull this one off, you'll be the Bathurst legend of all legends. Uh, I'm not thinking about that at this stage. I've got a, still got about, what, 29 laps to go. And there's like three, one, two, three cars ahead of me. That's right. Go get focus. Good luck. Thank you. Well, Larry Perkins. Car seven rejoined. It was first. It's now in fifth. But mean, keep in mind, that's not a race pace. He's just sitting behind in this queue. And it's not a very long queue at this stage of the afternoon. Car two now in sixth after its final stop. Well, they trail in behind the uh, Holden Jackaroo, the pace vehicle, the safety car. And it's class of the Road Australia uh, trial. That's the second time only we've seen the pace car out today. Glenn Seaton leads this one, and uh, Gardner is then there as well. See if you can see him. I think he's just about five cars back from the number four car. Only 12 cars in front of Gardner at this stage. All right, Wayne, and uh, of course, leading it is uh, Glenn Seaton. How are you focused, Wayne? Um, yeah, we're still okay. Uh, we dropped quite a bit of time when 
probably scared off the road, but uh, fortunately the pace car came out just then and uh, back in with a shot again. So I can see the leaders, so we're not too far behind now. Good boy. What about you, Glenn? In very good shape, Mike. I know we can um, run the rest of the race in 15, so that's basically the plan now. Just um, get into it. Well, you can give Wayne advice. He can hear you too. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Good, Glenn. Uh, I'm not too far behind. I'm I'll probably, hopefully I'll be up close soon, I hope. <laughs> we'll do our best to keep you behind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to do my best to try and stay, so it's going to be a close finish. Sure. It's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be a good race down the wire like every other the last two years, so that's good. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of fun, huh? Uh, Glenn, brake pedal feeling okay? Beautiful. Well, the car is just absolutely sensational, Alan. Uh, uh. Fuck it up. Couldn't answer better, really. Well, good luck to both of you boys. Thank you. Okay, go for it. A little bit of technology there, a first. The guy that was leading it and the guy who now leads it. Having a chat, he wants to uh, see Wayne up uh, better than where he is at the moment, but not on the, knocking at his doorstep for the win. The lights will come off the pace car. Looks like one more lap, is it? Yeah, that's like a Absolutely yeah. perfect countdown. The drivers just psyching themselves up taking a breath if they're wise drinking as much as they can deep breaths of air get that fresh air into them and uh, know that they've got a dog fight on their hands here this will be well lights are off on the pace car Alan one lap to go under the green and then it's all hell is going to break loose 137 laps completed they'll be back into it and 138 Car three has disappeared uh, from the freight train behind the pace car. The Lansdale smash repairs Commodore after such a strong showing they've dropped a valve. Bad luck, guys. Glenn, just back here for a sec. I won't hold you up for more than 10 seconds. Yeah, Mike. Does this thing feel bulletproof today? It feels fantastic. Does it? All the temperatures are, are cold and just the car feels fantastic. The brakes have been good. Um, I think it was the right thing to do early in the race where we just conserved and just followed. Glenn. And now's the time to get into it. Glenn, Mark Osler here. There's been Hello, a lot of, lot, of, g'day, a lot of chat about uh, the comparative performance of the Falcon and Commodore throughout this race. How have you seen it? Are they even or not? Oh, I think it's been pretty close, Mark. Like, it doesn't seem to be much in them all. Um, so you're confident you can take the fight right up to the Commodores in this final sprint to the flag? Well, I think so, yeah. Going on the um, pace we're running in the last stint, um, the, uh, I bank, think we can do it. the bank manager will have words with you on Monday if you don't, Glenn. Not wrong, Alan. And a lot of other people, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't put the mookers on you, but uh, you're, you're having a great ride, and this one you deserve. Yeah, thank you. Okay, buddy, go thank back, you, Glenn. Mike. Actually, just thinking about it, it pays 100 to win, a 50 bonus from Ford. That's 150. Plus, he gets his 30 grand or his Cortina. That's 180. We could start a telethon here and make it the even well, 200. Well, the well wishers <laughs> will at least throw in another 20 just to round it off the highest check in Australia. And this is what we need is some $100,000, $200,000 paydays so that the teams can go on, on to better things. Well put. They come across the mountain. And the fans, <laughs> if they've come here today wanting a, um, a real stink between Commodore and Falcon, they've got it. Can you believe this with about 50 minutes to run? Don't the fans know it too? They are warming up for a battle. This will be an absolute corker. And don't worry about the watch and win competition. It is now closed, so don't ring the 0055 across Australia. It's shut down an hour out from the finish. I hope uh, you've done well with your number so far. That's the order. I know there's a big party going on in uh, Chapel Street in Melbourne today at the uh, Black Prince. I hope everybody's got some good numbers in there. Glenn Seaton, Brad Jones, Alan Jones, Larry Perkins, Wayne Gardner, Stephen Richards, the rookie, six of them, bumper to bumper, and ready to let fly. Well, they'll get uh, back to racing at the end of the straight. It's incredible how this battle, this, this V8 racing, the first year we had two cars locked in battle for the win. They were 12 seconds apart. Last year we had two cars locked in battle. They were less than that. Now, we've got six cars on the lead lap going for the win. As we mentioned earlier in the in the, in the telecast, uh, they don't do much better at Daytona, and they've been practicing a lot longer over there. I said that never work. And I think we might have two more visitors from manufacturers next year too. So here they come, over the rise, down toward Caltex Chase for the final time under yellow. Seat 
Weaves backwards and forwards just to get a little bit of heat into the tyres. There's Larry Perkins lurking in there in front of all the privateers. There's Car 7, Wayne Gardner. He's got a few privateers to get out of the way if he's going to catch this bunch, but he's got his work cut out for him. As the pace car will go down the chute yep. into pit lane, so the very first corner at speed will be the left-hander at the end of Conrad. As they will accelerate now. Just about uh, time on the racetrack as they come out of that uh, turn to say They're hooroo to the jackaroo. They're Let's not get waiting. Here they go. Here's the green, and Glenn Seaton leads them through. Bradley Jones up behind him. Alan Jones in third. There's a lap car there. There's Larry Perkins. Wayne Gardner in there too. Here we go. Brad Jones certainly didn't leave any uh, moss unturned there. No. He was right into it. Well, the crowd are going bad. Falcon, Holden, Falcon, Holden. Look at the battle here. Perkins back there. A few privateers. There's Gardner trying to sort his way through the traffic. But Seaton opens the legs of the small block forward as he goes up the hill. Stretching it. Open three or four car lengths. Good. They head up to the top of the hill and Glenn Seaton opening the, uh, the gap to uh, the Coke machine. So the two PGA cars are running first and third. Looking for Perkins. He's got the headlights on. St storming at the pack. Well, they'll be in qualifying mode now. They'll just be driving them exactly the way they would if they were trying to qualify in the top ten. So uh, look out, world. There's going to be some real action here over the next ten laps. 138 laps completed as they cross the start-finish line that time. Over our track cam. <laughs> look at Perkins. He's in there, too. The crowd lets out a big cheer. Seaton in command. Brad Jones in second place. Jones trying to track him down in the second of the PJ Fords. A roar as they come through McPhillamy Park. 200 kilometres an hour. Keep in mind, these cars are all tired. There's Alan Grice watching on. He's done his work for the day. Can Alan Jones bring it home in first position? Well, oh, gee, Seaton is giving this absolutely everything. Gee, he was confident, wasn't he? Look at it. He's opened up the gap on Brad Jones. Three or four car lengths as they come down the mountain. Under full green, down toward Forest Elbow. Larry Perkins got the lights on. Up behind Alan Jones. There's four of them in this. Oops. Jones, he made a little move there. He's anxious. He wants to go on with it. But uh, the Coke Commodores have got plenty of top-end speed. Full credit to uh, Rod Benson, who's put these engines together this weekend. Over 600 horsepower. He claims from these Chevys. And haven't they got some mumbo in a straight line? Look at Larry. Here comes Perkins. Down the outside of 35. Jones, that's what he's got rid of. Listen to the crowd roar as Perkins comes inside of him down through Caltex Chase. He's up to third position. Perkins is on a flyer. Into Caltex Chase, the exit. Boy, has he made this a race and a half. Shades of 93. This is going to be unreal. Unreal? It's already unreal, Alan. Look at Larry Perkins. Gets a few metres on him under brakes as they swing back onto pit straight. Closing right up on the number four coke car. Well, if you wonder why Seaton's taken off, he knows enough about Larry's engineering prowess. Well, Larry Listen has to had the crowd. it. The majority are Holden fans here. Larry. And they're willing him on as he comes through this turn. He's got mountain straight and he comes up on the tail of Brad Jones. Larry has had an enormous amount of car speed in this car. There's the coke team watching on anxiously. They can see Perkins taking big chunks of time out of Brad Jones up ahead of him. Perkins disappears over the hump. Then it's Jones. Then it's Perkins. Then it's Jones. Alan Jones. Look at the field. We take Castrol Oil's race cam from the front spoiler of the Castrol Holden. Oh, Back there he is. Inside. Very, Didn't very close. To, must have been a tap there. Had to be. Look out, Brad Jones. I'm coming through. Larry has an enormous amount of speed in this late stage of the day. He is flying. Yes, he got sucked in on there. Here he comes. Yes. Little yes. nose Careful. down there. We'll get much closer than that. See the oil stains at the back of the Commodore struggle on. Everything in this race is tired. The tyres are tired. The drivers are tired. Legends of Motorsport getting a good run here at the Sydney Entertainment Centre. And Jones has moved up on the tail again of Perkins as they come across the mountain. Listen to the crowd. This what's Jones put up a fight here. Five times Oscar champion. He's used to close combat. Listen to the crowd across the mountains. Larry Perkins brings this race alive. Yes, he's going to line him up now. He knows that there's no use fooling around here through the dip. He'll try and get as close as he can down onto uh, Conrad and uh, pull out of the slipstream. He's got a powerful Commodore in front of him and will drag him along. We got his girlfriend there, Tony, watching on anxiously, no doubt. There's the rest of the team. Castrol team in the other up the other end of pit lane. There's uh, Jones is making some ground on Perkins. He's really put the squeeze on across now that Larry, top part of the hill. Now Larry will work if he can to the inside down here. This is exactly what he did the previous lap. He winds it up. But as we've said before, the Coke cars are quick. 
Brad stays to the right side of the road. There's no opening there. What about the inside, says Larry? 280 clicks. No, it won't work. Down into the next left hand. He might give that a try on the exit. Chilling stuff. Bradley under enormous pressure here. Larry Perkins really applying the thumb screws. Jones gets out of that corner reasonably quick. Larry filling up the mirrors of the Coke number four. Which way is he going to go down? Down the inside here of Brad Jones. Got him. He's driving up to the front. Second spot, 29th to second. What a drive. Can you believe this? More than a lap down. Larry Perkins in second position. He's only got one car ahead of him. Again, we're heading for a classic fourth hole battle here. 140 and laps completed. 21 laps remaining and time for Larry to try and reel Glenn Seaton in. That's quite a margin to fill, but uh, if well, anybody can do it, Larry Perkins can. He's got plenty of time. Perkins just, uh, Seaton just fired off a 2.15.1. Larry at 2.17 as he was getting past James there, but watch the next one. He's on a fly. 4.7 seconds the gap between Perkins and Seaton that time around. Yeah, the battle getting past Jones did cost Larry dearly. Enormous they tension. They can't hardly watch. <laughs> Russell Engel there. Don't heading worry about it, Russ. Poor old Russell. He Russ, can't believe it. Russ, you've done a fine job. Now you'll see what Larry does. <laughs> I tell you, he couldn't have done it without Russell Engel today. He Russell, was able to answer the challenge. He really has done a superb job. And the main thing is he hasn't made a mistake. He's kept the car straight. Has a flat spot on the tyre. Hasn't done any major problem with the car at all. There's Seaton sneaks through. And where is Perkins? Happy as Larry standing on it and gaining. Glenn was very wise to go like a rabbit because he knew that once this fellow gets on his tail, it's going to be a worrisome uh, run to the finish. Here's the top ten for you. I'm sure you know what it's all about. It's Seaton and Parsons leading from Perkins and Ingle, Jones and Percy, Jones and Rice, Gardner and Crompton round out that five. Six spot held down by uh, Richardson and Ollison, seven by O'Brien and Johnson, then it's Scott and Clellan, Waldock and McLaughlin, Poole and Ordinsky. What a race we've got going here at Mount Panorama Bathurst, and we'll be back after the break. About uh, four and a half seconds, lap 141 of 161, with five hours, 37.09 into the great race. And boy, we've got a race happening here at Mount Panorama with Glenn Seaton and the Peter Jackson Falcon number 30. Four and a half seconds clear of this man who's come from a lap down. But we're looking at the fastest guy on the track at the moment. He's running around at 14, 214, 1 1 against Glenn's time of 15, 1 4. So marginally faster than Glenn, but Glenn in the lead at the moment. Yeah, 14, 9 9 from Larry, a 15 1. So it's just two tenths of, oh, less than that. 19. Less than two tenths of a second. Yeah, 19 laps to settle into it. Look at Russell Engel up there in the window box, Alan. Hand over his face. He cannot believe it. First time with Larry Perkins at Bathurst, and he's staring right down the barrel of his first Bathurst win. How would you feel? He's got a long way to go. Leave <laughs> oh. me alone, he he's said. Worrying. He is That's looking very distressed. That's a motion for you. Don't worry. These fellows have got their hearts where they belong. Well, we're riding with Larry now, but Glenn Seaton, give him due credit. He is fighting back. He is holding this lead. 4.3 seconds. Larry was only able to take one tenth of a second off him that last time around. They climb over the top of the mountain as the big crowd here at Mount Panorama tries to will Larry Perkins on. And you can hear that very, very clearly. Sounds like Wembley Stadium, Mike. There's the gap. Down into Firestone Dipper. Glenn's on the exit out of there as Larry now goes through the dipper. Glenn's on his way to Forest Elbow. This is a gripping contest. What psychologically Glenn doesn't want is just to see the flash of white in his rear view mirror. He'll be struggling to stay in front or not struggling, be working hard to stay in front. He just doesn't want to have this castle car breathing down so close that he can see the reflection in his rear view mirror. Oh, Seaton has a look down on his driver's door mirror there, see where Larry is. He's uh, keeping those mirrors very watchful as it comes through Caltex Chase once again. Too much longer by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, 18 laps to go. It's only uh, going to take one little slip, isn't it? Slip. One slip. Well, 18 laps is hard on the car. Still plenty of wear on the tyres. And uh, although Glenn said his brakes were fine, maybe in 18 laps they might not be. And uh, really... Tremendous concentration here from these two great drivers. Glenn Seaton in the lead in the Peter Jackson Ford. Let's watch where Perkins is, emerging through the heat haze. There he is, come across the start finish line this time around. 4.5 seconds, so Seaton has opened another tenth on Larry. He is fighting hey, back big time. Young uh, Jake. On Jack uh, Perkins, he's praying for his dad. Yeah. <laughs> little, little Larry. 
Good on you, Jack. He's doing his best for you. He comes to every touring car round. Yep. He's right into this touring car racing at a very young age. And boy, he's willing that on. Yeah, Brian uh, Johnson car, the 18 car, is uh, in the pits. Last time around, look at that. It's just uh, three one hundredths of a second between them. A 214.80 for Seaton Perkins. Just three hundredths of a second faster than that. These two cars are so evenly matched. Seaton, in fact, can you believe that? Lap 143, the fastest lap he's done in the race. Well, Steve Johnson, he's got reasons to. Yes. <laughs> Stephen Johnson, we saw in the pits just then in car number 18, the Shell FAI entry was in uh, seventh place when he went into the pits. Well, word from the pits is uh, Perkins' tyres may be a little suspect at this pace. Keep an eye on that for you, but Seaton has certainly opened the gap. Murray trying to put maximum pressure on him, but Seaton's opened up two tenths of a second. Yeah, it's a little mind game going on here. Glenn knows he's got to try and respond with everything that Larry throws at him, and if, with the gap that he's got, he's got the psychological edge. So, believe me, if uh, there was ever a hard day's work, here's uh, David Parsons uh, sweating it out on Glenn's behalf as well. Imagine lock up there on the inside, nothing too much to worry about. Imagine the emotion for Bo Seaton. Uh, Glenn's dad won this race, of course, 30 years ago, 1965, and a little Ford Cortina. Here's his son. Still under the blue oval and looking at this uh, sentimental uh, win and a nice way to finish off their association with Peter Jackson. Mm -hmm. Down through the chase once again. Has he foiled Larry's challenge? We shall see next time across the start finish line. Just three hundredths of a second, as I said, between them last time around, which is quite incredible. Over 6.2 kilometres of testing racetrack. Well, he's not fooling around. He knows what he has to do if he wants to win it. He's got a tough car, Hombre behind him. Sure has. Seaton back onto pit straight once again. He'll clock up 144. 2.15.4. A little slower that time around. Let's see what Larry Perkins can do. A 2.15.3. So Larry, a tenth of a second faster. The gap down to 4.41 seconds. So they're maintaining it. <laughs> Perkins has a look up in the rear view mirror. Not too much pressure at the moment. There's Bo Seaton. That's the man who won the race in 1965 joined Glenn when they set up their own touring car team back in 1989 and this will be the crowning glory for all those efforts and all those years of disappointment at Mount Panorama. We've got some racing to do yet. And isn't he? <laughs> he's just so cool. He's sitting there cute, chewing away on his plastic straw. It's like he's chewing on his favourite chocolate bar, doesn't it? This speed to this guy comes quite naturally. He's always been mercurially uh, fast. Just a really good operator in a race car. And I guess uh, over the years, you do tend to forget just how good Glenn is. He's a fabulous race driver. Another product from uh, karting in Australia. Came up through the rakes and his own team. What a crowning uh, achievement this will be since he formed Team Blue. Well, and James's teammate is currently the fastest man on the track, going faster than Seaton at this stage, but it doesn't matter. He's uh, a good uh, almost three seconds behind Perkins. 4.41 seconds the gap the last time around. Can Seaton bring it home? Lap 144 and a half. And we've got one in the pits there. Oh, what a shame. Yes, that's the, that's um, the Mark Poole car, mm. is it not, from uh, South Australia? We're Northern running Farm so Australia. strongly all day with uh, Ed Ordinsky. A little bit of oil coming out of the bank. Obviously a diff leak, and uh, once they overheat, uh, it's not much saving them. Seaton thundering down Conroy. He'll be concentrating now very, very hard on his braking. He won't want to have these tyres. Rich Dunn running through here all day long, and he knows now it's his job to uh, nurse them just that little bit without losing too much pace. And he's very, very effective through the chicane. Let's check out the top ten for you. Glenn Seaton leads the two he's won thousand. Second is Larry Perkins. Third, Alan Jones. Fourth is Wayne Gardner. And fifth, the jones percy combination, the second coat car. That leaves in sixth spot Anders Olofsson and Stephen Richards. Scott and Cleland are now seventh. O'Brien and Johnson eighth. Waldock and McLaughlin are ninth. And Poole and Ordinsky round out the top ten. The sprint to the checker is just about on its way. Bathurst, the two is 1,000 for 1995. Lap 146 of 161, five hours, 47 and 25. Glenn Seaton continues to hold that buffer out to five seconds over Larry Perkins in car number 11, the Castrol Commodore. Then Alan Jones has actually closed on uh, Perkins, so it's tightening up for second as Seaton comes down into Forest Elbow again. He's answered the challenge. Certainly has, and uh, the real estate boys will tell you position is everything, and 
This is the pot. This is the spot he wants to be in at the moment. Well, he'll be coming up to 14 laps to go when he crosses the start finish line this time around. He's keeping those good, good look on those mirrors. I was just thinking, uh, uh, Tony Murphy, the Peter Jackson team manager for Glenn Seaton, he loves his work. He's down with Andy. A man that certainly does love his work, but th today's a hard day in the office. Tony, how are you coping? Oh, it's not bad, Andy. There's not long to go now, but these last few laps are a fairly anxious time for us. Are you allowed to uh, are you allowed to say what you said when you saw the pace car come out? It's your worst nightmare. It was, mate. Believe me, we had that little jump on the Coca-Cola car, but we lost that with the pace car. But never mind, Glenn seems to have it under control at the moment. Alan's just got a burst on then, so... Who knows? It looked like a battle between Peter Jackson Racing and Coca-Cola, and all of a sudden this uh, old bloke driving a Castrol car has turned out of, out of the clouds. When Larry came in very early, you naturally think, well, the way the pace is going to be, he's behind the eight ball, but he keeps trucking on, doesn't he? We'll let you go. We wish you all the best. Thanks, Andy. Bye. Tony Murphy. Hell of a nice fella. Obviously made a big difference to the... Uh, mechanical reliability of the cars this year. Glenn was relieved of a lot of the responsibility of running the team so he could just concentrate on driving. I think Tony perhaps has given the team the direction it needed in preparation to make the car hang together. It is a mental drain uh, worrying about getting the car just made and built and engineered and then drive it if you're worn out before you get behind the wheel. That's not good. So all of these fellows in the pit lane, as we alluded to before, as the unsung heroes that uh, support their drivers, uh, mentally and uh, physically with their own hard work. Um, yep, 5.4 seconds, the gap, so Seaton really is opening up just by a tenth of a second away from the moment over Larry. Well, Larry's top man, Curly Orr, should be happy, and the, I think Richard Hay actually is with him. I'm not sure if Richard... Larry's known for running his own team, Curly, in a big way, but uh, you're the man that has to take over when he's out there on the racetrack. Oh, well, someone's got to guide him along and uh, direct the boys, I suppose. But uh, everyone's put in a fantastic job, and we just hope Larry can bring it home. It's a fantastic performance, considering it was so far back after that pit stop on the first lap. Yeah, we had a, uh, a minor hiccup at the start of the race, but we've gone absolutely flat out all day. And um, thanks to the pace car, we're now in the race. Now, there was some question. Some of the guys were saying that maybe the tyres wouldn't last and maybe that would be a problem. He's dropping about a tenth of a second a lap. Is that the reason? Well, I'm not sure whether he's just trying to look after them, but I'm sure the Dunlop's all hanging there. And there's still a bit of a way to go. On my word, there is. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. No worries. Well said. There's Perkins and Alan Jones closing up at the end of Conrad. Well, it'll be quite a controversial one, too, if they do end up with Peter, two Peter Jackson cars. First and second positions, Alan Jones, of course, splitting from the uh, Glen Seaton racing team to set up his own Falcon squad in 1996. And Starting taking, taking uh, Glenn's longtime sponsor, Philip Morris, with him. And boy, I can tell you, in that uh, pit during the week, he could just about cut the atmosphere with a knife. Couldn't have been too pleasant. But they, to Glenn's credit, he's given Alan a very strong, very competitive race car. There's been no tit for tat here. Seaton has known his responsibility to his sponsors and to his team to prepare two first class cars. He's done that. The yeah. only executive decision that uh, Glenn exercised was. Uh, swapping the uh, driver pairings and electing to have David Parsons go with him and uh, leave Alan Grace with uh, Alan Jones and he's the boss, he's entitled to do that and uh, obviously proved to be a wise decision. So Alan Jones, the battle within a battle, he's closing in on Larry ever so slightly. It was one second last time round, down to 0.55, was a visual gap. So Jones looks like he may pounce before this race is over. They come across the top of the mountain not a soul has left Mount Panorama today. This gripping battle that started off with, uh, with Mark Scaife doing so well, and Lee, or Jim Richards, I should say. Uh, that all fell away. Then Neil Cropton led for a spell. They're coming up on a lap car now, the Wayne Russell Roadshill Union steel car. But Alan Jones take advantage under brakes. It'll be a nice run to Conrod for him if he can get the toe from the Castro car in front. Castrol Chevy not lacking for straight line speed, so Alan Jones may be able to use that. Top 10 split. Uh, Jones has uh, always been good at arithmetic. He knows the difference between uh, second and third, 40,000 for second, 28 for third. He'll work hard for that extra 12,000. <laughs> five Holdens, five Fords in the remaining top 10 on the circuit.
Well, I think the interesting thing out of this, Alan, with all the politics over the Falcon Aero package, looking at Glenn's speed, really has... Uh, I think the authorities, they couldn't have quite got it closer, could they? Well, they could have got one thing right. They could have got the timing of the way they want to handicap the, the two uh, uh, manufacturers uh, better. I, I firmly disagree with the changes that are uh, 10 days out before the major race. Do you think the four teams were lacking in time to get the car, car set up the way they wanted? Well, uh, the thing that they were lacking was the fact that the tires are baked in. The tires have to be made, ordered and made uh, in the August, um, September uh, period. And uh, change your body aerodynamics uh, with the tires in the molds. Uh, if they don't work, well, yep. it, it's a hard uh, X to bear. 6.11 seconds, that's the gap. You saw that on screen between the race leader, Glenn Seaton, and second place, Larry Perkins, who has quite a job on his hands, fending off Alan Jones, who wants to challenge for that spot. And give Glenn's team not only a win at Bathurst, but a 1-2. 11 and a half laps remaining. Wayne Gardner, race cam, Holden race cam, aboard the Coke number seven Commodore. Wayne running in fourth position. So Very 11, commendable, we might add. 11 seconds behind Alan Jones. So. Uh, Unless those two fail, he's not in with a podium chance at the moment. The man who led the race at the start and uh, for the first five laps. Neil Compton, as we uh, saw, led it uh, briefly in the mid-stages and then had a slight mishap that uh, cost them some time. But they're still there, fighting on uh, as the race winds down with 12 laps remaining and in a very solid fourth position. They certainly acquitted themselves well, and uh, their sponsors cannot be unhappy with the level of exposure that uh, has been uh, achieved here today. Uh, telecast going around the world to uh, almost 400 million people, and uh, I don't think there are too many aficionados in Australia that are missing this at the moment. There must be at least 5 million Australians watching this as we speak. Well, it should certainly show they can turn out a quality product. The uh, tremendous straight line speed, good horsepower, Good tyre package, the car prepared very well. But they're really on their way. Their time will come. And of course, their second team car is uh, on the track right behind them. So, uh, excellent performance in the fourth and fifth place. Well, Larry's fighting back, James. Giving increasing fire here, but he's not quite able to get into a position to pass. Larry's, Larry. got, the, Larry's got the headlights on. That should tell anyone he's coming up on. He means business. He'll use all of the road. Larry loves good brakes, and he works extremely hard at getting just the very last tad out of uh, brake performance. And uh, it's going to take a very determined Alan Jones to get by uh, Larry under brakes, I can assure you. Every last viewing vantage point here is packed to the rafters with uh, 16, uh, sorry, 11 laps remaining in the race now. And uh, he couldn't have had a better scenario. Look at this. He's coming under fire. This is Stephen Richards. The rookie getting up behind Bradley Jones. This is the battle for fifth and sixth position. Stephen Richards, of course, son of Jimmy, running uh, just about everything from Oscar to two-litre touring cars as he builds up his uh, repertoire of skills in motorsport. And this is a great way to finish. He always approached it very much like Stephen Johnson, a very level, very cool head on his shoulders. He said, if I can get a top six position this year at my first attempt, I'll be absolutely wrapped. Well, look at him, he's running in sixth position and challenging for fifth. And uh, obviously winner of the Rookie Year, the Denny Holm Rookie of the Year Award, a very nice accolade to have on your CV. And he's putting uh, plenty of pressure now on Brad Jones. He's really made up quite a gap on him now. So Jones may well have to fight very hard for fifth by the time this race is finished. Here's the order. On lap number 150, Glenn Seaton, the leader, in the Peter Jackson Falcon, clear of Perkins and Ingall in the Castrol Commodore. Third is Alan Jones in the second of the PJ cars. Then it's uh, Wayne Gardner in the Coke Commodore. Jones and Percy in the second of the Coca-Cola cars. Sixth position still running strong. Olofsson and Stephen Richards seventh. Charlie O'Brien and Stephen Johnson doing a good job. Scott and Cleland, good performance by the Pinnacle Commodore in eighth place. Waldock and Lachlan into the top ten. Ninth spot, in fact. And Longhurst and Park running tenth. Eleventh spot is 39. O'Brien and Callahan in the Everlast Automotive Commodore. And it's Poole and Ordinsky. They went out on lap 136 at the same time. Taylor and Bell in the Xerox Shop Commodore. They went out as well. 133 Heffernan and Voigt in the Bryce Pack Commodore. And also the Ashby Reed Lansvale Smash Repairs car.
Australia in 16th position. Lamont and Gulson, Parsons and Crick in 17th. So they're out now on lap 127. Attard and Crick in 18th spot. Russell and Shaw in 19th position. And out on lap 110 went Johnson and Bow. There are exactly 10 laps remaining in the great race. Can you believe this? Larry Perkins coming to the top of the mountain. And listen to the crowd go berserk because he is leading the race with nine laps remaining. An engine problem for Glenn Seaton and the Peter Jackson Falcon as Dr. Valve dropped the piston, something wrong with the engine, badly misfiring. And, and Wilco, just as you were saying, that the other Peter Jackson car has stopped on the climb up to BP Cutting. Alan Jones is also out of the race. And is running backwards down the hill. No, he's managed to... Well, there he is. Holy smoke. No, sorry. Second. No, sorry. That is car 30. My mistake. That was Seaton. He didn't quite make it right. up the hill that time around. So the engine has died on the race leader. Can you believe that? Well, that That's is terrible. the end. Look at Bo. Bo is Barry absolutely Seaton. shattered. Glenn's father, winner here in 1965. Glenn, a shake of the head as he backs the car off the circuit. Barry Seaton in tears there. The great dream has evaporated okay. in the space of a few seconds. Glenn Seaton in the car. We're just trying to establish that he can... Uh, here is Glenn. Commiserations, mate. Yeah, Alan. Pretty disappointing. You just can't believe it, but people around the world have said bell springs are the toughest item in any engine. You don't have to feel badly about it, mate. It is the toughest thing to win this race. Yeah, no Commiserations wrong. to your dad. I know how hard you've worked. Yeah, we've gone so close today. Just can't believe it. Like, When did you have the first indication, Glenn? Something was wrong. Just bang, just like that, wasn't it? Well, it was about five laps ago it started to come in, and I just thought it was going to be okay, but... Got worse. That's life. Glenn, that's life. there is a Tui's 1000 waiting for you, I guarantee you. you just got to keep hanging in there. It must no, be... This is just heartbreaking, I tell you. Absolutely, because you've got a team of guys there that have really slaved for 12 months to try and achieve this. Absolutely, and, like, to come this close, it's, oh, it's, it's just... Words can't explain it. Really can't. Well, mate, you don't, right, mate. you don't lose a race like this. We'll let you go. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. That is a tragedy. And I mean, you can, you can, well, you can gather there just the emotion that uh, that has got a grip on uh, Glenn Seaton, having come so close to victory in this event. Gary, you're good with words. Uh, could Hollywood have scripted a finish like this? Absolutely not. Are we, are we going to run a campaign now, Larry, for? Prime Minister? Well, he'd have to win, wouldn't he? We were lauding uh, Larry Perkins and hailing him for the great comeback from 29th position to a situation where he looked like he had a chance to win the race. Then we said, no, hang on, Seaton's done it, Seaton's got it, he's strong, he's going to hold on and win, and then unbelievably, <laughs> we've got Look this at problem. Jack, little and Jack Perkins, he's in tears. Well, I think so is Russell Engel. That's his aunt hanging on to him there. Can you believe the depths and the heights of human emotion that have been tested here this afternoon? Glenn Seaton so close yet so far. You d as you'd know, Alan Jones, as you'd know, uh, Alan Moffat, sorry, you're not a winner until you get across that line. No, this is like any other sport. If you give up, you're a loser. And here's a guy who's no loser. Oh, Alan Moffat. Too, feeling the emotion he's been there before let's just uh, clarify things here larry perkins the leader of the race in the number 11 cast off falcon of commodore rather second place is being held by car number 35 now that is alan jones in the peter jackson falcon glenn seaton's teammate jonesy holding on strong to fly the flag for peter jackson third spot car number seven the coca-cola commodore wayne gardner at the wheel fourth spot and having just moved into that position is young stephen richards in car number two the sole surviving winfield car sixth position is held by the second coca-cola car with uh, brad jones at the wheel seven laps to go well here's a guy that sticks to his principles and uh he's always advocated for a one-car team he's taken pressure from sponsors to produce a two-car team he said no leave me to my own devices let me work on one car i'll put all my marbles in one in one barrel and look at this result here today he just never gave up the heartbreak he must have had on that opening lap when he got a puncture with a, a dust up with the craig lounge but uh, here to fight back over a thousand kilometers and bring this car home is just an absolute fantastic achievement Little Jack Perkins there, all choked up, watching his dad. Well, I saw Jack uh, and Larry on Tuesday morning here at Panorama, the breakfast with the stars, and uh, 
with you know dancing gloves and entertainment but he was having a wonderful time but i think the grin from ear to ear is going to be even bigger after dad takes the ticket flag in this race fingers crossed because it's still not over we've still got a couple of laps to go here 154 larry's on 154 and a half completed now so he hasn't got that far 161 well he's got the advantage of being able to glide his car around now he's not chasing someone down He's taking the lead. He'll know exactly the gap between him and the second place car. Oh, and he'll just play that on a break down towards the last few laps. Top six cars on the track now. We've got Commodore, Falcon, Commodore, 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 Falcon. And, uh, so. Lightning Larry Perkins, the man who won the race here in partnership with the late Greg Hansford in 1993, coming off pole position that year. Uh, almost well we thought it was tragedy today when they had to come in to change a flat tire after the end of one lap is in the lead and with only uh, six laps remaining in the 1995 two is 1000 larry perkins this is a miracle no we're not there yet no i know not quite but by gee <laughs> what you've achieved to this point is a miracle uh, well we set out on a mission and uh it's all been going pretty good russell ingall's done a great job for you oh absolutely superb job well, Larry, we'll get a little bit of water organized for you tonight because you'll certainly be able to walk on it tonight. Too far ahead of me yet. There's six more left, mate. Okay, we'll let you get on with it, Larry. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Larry Perkins. He's not going to uh, to take credit or uh, grab victory yet. Well, the he, thing above all people, knows just how far there is still to go. The thing is, Wilco, he's seen them falling. He's seen the pack of cards falling in front of him all day. He knows that he's just as vulnerable, so he's not taking any... Uh, Accolades just yet. Right, he's got an engine under his bonnet and he's got Bell Springs running up there, up and down at a million seconds a minute. But there is one thing about Larry, he builds a bulletproof car. Let's look at the way they're running. Perkins and Ingle, of course, lap 155, Jones and Grice, and they're 6.8 seconds behind. Gardner and Crompton in third, Olsen, Richards in fourth, and Jones and Percy in fifth position. Sixth, Seaton and Parsons have just gone out, 152. O'Brien and Johnson in seventh, Scott McClellan in eighth. Wall Dr. McLaughlin hanging on in ninth and in tenth, Longhurst and Park. Don't go away, we've got the big finish coming up for Tui's 1000 when we come back. Things are being written in the book of uh, the history of the great race here at Mount Panorama, the Tui's 1000, as we see Larry Perkins at the wheel of the number 11, Castrol Commodore, possibly set to take victory in just four and a half laps from now. Can you believe this? Larry Perkins leads, Alan Jones second, there's Neil Crompton, and uh, Wayne Gardner, his partner, is running in third spot at the moment. Stephen Richards, fourth for Winfield. Then Brad Jones for Coke. And Stephen Johnson in the Shell FAI car surviving into the top half dozen. There's no wonder there's a bit of tension on uh, Crompton's face. Car seven with Wayne Gardner of the wheel is closing on Alan Jones over these final laps too. Well, Glenn Seaton, we lost uh, when uh, the Peter Jackson number 30 car expired uh, four laps, uh, five laps ago. And somebody's always looking for uh, some portent in these things, and uh, they've just pointed out to me that this was Glenn Seaton's 13th time at uh, Bathurst. He went out with 13 laps to go, and his engine number is number 13. Make of that what you will. You superstitious will go? No. Well, I think you'd have to be after that. That is extraordinary. And engine number 13. It's engine number 13 that's let him down. This race has been incredibly tough. Look at all the leaders today. Scaife lead he's out and Dick looked like winning it non-stop Seaton lead he's out of course Alan Jones lead he's currently running second it's been so tough on the equipment here Wayne Gardner working like he's never worked before behind the wheel of the Cape Commodore he's got Alan Jones just up ahead of him 4.7 seconds laps ticking down could Jones suffer the same fate as Seaton and let the Coke team through for their first podium finish about this there's Jones and Gardner's just approaching with Philomy Park it's going to be tight Stephen Richards for uh, the number two Winfield car, Stephen Johnson for the number 18 Shell FAI car, both looking for a top six finish at the moment. Well, preparation is what uh, wins races. You have to prepare to win, you have to finish to win, and uh, although Glenn wasn't able to make it, uh, this car came out of the same garage and the same Oof. dedication. There's Gartner, look at him, he's giving it everything. He just about touched the wall there, he might have even. Look at the car moving around on the suspension as he chases Jones down Conrad straight. Lap 157. Four laps to go and they finish this one. There's Jones. Disappears out of our shot. Here comes Gardner. Two world champions going at it. Final lap.
laps of the two is 1000 they both desperately want to win this race you're talking they're both Australians they both won world championships but what means just as much to them as victory in Australia's premier race three laps to go Wayne Gardner has just posted his fastest lap for the race so he so certainly what? is trying he's trying he has he's got the lights on he's showing that he's fit he looked fit when he got in the car and he was very calm when he was speaking to us so he's doing an extremely good job 5.9 seconds the gap that time around have survived some very difficult conditions out here today. It was unexpectedly hot at Mount Panorama today. That caused some handling, some tyre problems for the cars, but also the temperatures inside the cabin of these cars is incredible. And with these fireproof driving suits on, these guys just dehydrate like crazy. Well, the AIS gave us some figures uh, earlier in the day. I think we've got a losing three and a half kilos of fluid mm. per one and a half hour driving stint. That's a staggering amount of perspiration, isn't it? Well, everything is so hot. Gearboxes around the 140 degree C mark, and uh, the radiant heat that comes up through the floorboards is is very, very considerable. Wayne Gardner racing for Coca-Cola, car number seven in third place, pushing hard, trying to wheel in Alan Jones, who holds down second spot in car 35 for uh, the Peter Jackson team. Larry Perkins, the Castrol Commodore, still in front, looking for another victory here at Bathurst. He had three in partnership with Peter Brock in the 70s. He had a victory with uh, the late Greg Hansford here in 1993, and now in partnership with Russell Engel, is looking for yet another win in the two is 1000. Jones with the lights on. To warn the few remaining tail enders that he's coming through. He's got virtually a clear track. As he heads down Conrod once again, Wayne Gardner will soon be on the Conrod straight with him. Yes, it's a big ass still. Considerable gap, but Wayne throwing everything he can at it. We've seen him do that in the past when he's on two wheels. And this is what ironic, Alan, that in a situation where you think Jones would end, maybe end up with a dud car in the tit-for-tat situation, knowing the team situation. Here's Jones bringing a very strong finish for PJ and not team owner Glenn Seaton. I'm glad you mentioned that. It just showed that the professionalism of the Seaton management uh, did their part down to the last. Just two laps remaining now as Larry Perkins crosses the start and finish line here at Mount Panorama. As you can see, just a little brake lock up there from uh, Wayne Gardner pushing hard in pursuit of these two front-running cars. Here's the second, or here's the leading vehicle, Larry Perkins, heading up Mountain Straight. Well, they've both got some winning pedigree on the side. Fans give them a wave. Alan Jones there in the Peter Jackson car, the blue car. Perkins Engineering Commodore. And uh, our next shot. This man, when you think about it, really is central to the growth of this uh, five-liter category. Alan, he's built more than two dozen Commodore kit cars over the last three years. There'd been even one more like him. Uh, the uh, depth of field would be considerably stronger, but to his credit, uh, he produces a car that he's prepared uh, to build to his standards, and a fellow can walk in with a check and get exactly what he races, and uh, that's, what it's, uh, that's what's required when you're shoveling out a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Listen to that crowd, he's done well, and a fabulous, fabulous uh, contribution here by Dunlop. They've been under severe problems this year, having to ship their combination to uh, England. But So Perkins brings it down the mountain, through the Firestone Dipper, down toward Forest Elbow. Lights ablaze, he's almost home. Should have one lap to go when he comes across the start finish line this time around. There's Jack, he's almost... Dad's almost home. And his sister, Nicola. Nicola there too. Oh. Boy, oh boy. Incredible race of changing fortunes. So much drama. And this leading about six and a half hours of mechanical and physical torture. And Perkins, once again, has come from last. The first time, I can't imagine a time in the history of this race, never been where done. a guy in last position has won the race. Never been done. When he came in on the first lap, we said, yeah, we knew he was going to fight back, and we figured he'd get a top 10 finish, but uh, to do it in this order and land up here in the, in the front row. Last lap board is being ready for Larry Perkins, and they will cheer themselves hoarse for the last two minutes and 15.5 seconds around this circuit for Larry Perkins. Here they go. Won't be happy until he gets up on top of the hill. Gary has still got a car behind him, and... Uh, 
anything was to go wrong on the back straight here on the straight, he'll, he'll still be in trouble. Well, if it'll ease those with their fingers crossed, Larry's finishing record in this V8 formula is quite extraordinary. Won the race here in 1993, ran with a bulletproof run last year to third position. Now he's done a faultless run once again. So Larry has proved on numerous occasions he can build a bulletproof car. Perkins the leader from Alan Jones, Wayne Gardner for Coke still in third spot. Then comes uh, Stephen Richards in the surviving Winfield car followed by Brad Jones in the second of the Coke entries, then Stephen Johnson in car number 18 for Shell FAI. They are the top six as we get uh, through the midway stages of this final lap of the Tui's 1000. What an effort, and just listen again to the crowd as Larry Perkins comes around here at the top of the mountain. and what a victory this is going to be for Larry Perkins and for Russell Engel. This is just an incredible performance, as we've said several times in the last few minutes, a last to first performance for Larry Perkins. And as he comes into out of tire power turn at Forest Elbow, Larry Perkins behind the wheel and co-driver Russell Engel is in the pits. Hey, uh, thank you, Larry. Thanks for uh, thanks for putting me in it, mate. I'll uh, tell you what, when you get back there, I'm going to give you the biggest kiss. <laughs> I'd prefer to get it from your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you would. Uh, you have to put up with me, mate. Hey, just thank you. No, you drive tremendously, mate. Right. While well, I'm still going around in the car, going, I want to thank my 15 folks at work. They just did a superb job. And the pressure of looking after the 10 customers, I'm just very thankful to those folks. Larry Perkins and Russell Engel, the great race winners, the Tui's 1000 for 1995. Thanks, well, well, that is like just a phenomenal them. effort. Larry, could you ever have believed six and a half hours ago you'd be taking the winner's checkered flag? I would say no, but look at the... Uh, a joyous expression on the face of Russell Engel, first time here, and in partnership with Larry Perkins, has scored himself a win. Alan Jones, second place. Congratulations from the Peter Jackson team. But uh, imagine how they feel. Larry Perkins, can you still hear us? Yeah, loud and clear. Larry, Mark Osler, would you ever have believed six and a half hours ago you'd be taking the checkers flag? Well, uh, up until uh, we got lapped, I still thought we had a chance. When we got lapped, though, with that pace car business, I thought that was, we were bucket, yeah. But Russell did such a tremendous job, though. He hung, hung in there. But that's really what uh, sorted it out. Congratulations, mate. A superb effort. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. We've got uh, young Jack and all of the people in your pit area at the moment on camera, Larry, and uh, they're all in tears. Jack oh, yeah. and Nicola, they're all crying. Yeah, I feel a bit that way myself. Well, you just let it hang on, mate. Well, you've had five great victories here at Mount Panorama, Larry, and uh, this would rank equally with the others, I think. This is the best, mate. This